Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen neighbor feels entitled to camp on my land. I own 16 acres of woodland behind my house and it's very clearly my property as there are signs up stating that it is private property. I'm generally good with people walking through it, taking their dog for a walk, or hiking, or even local kids playing there as it's a safe place and beautiful. And so long as they don't cause any damage or mess with the trees, I see no reason to get upset over this. An issue came up, however, tonight when I was on a walk and I saw a fire through the trees. I admit I panicked, thinking a dog walker had been out and tossed a cigarette or some local teens were setting fires for fun. I rushed out to check on it and tried to put out the fire and found one of my neighbors camping with her boyfriend and friends. It was a group of five people in their mid-twenties and they had a roaring campfire going. They got startled by me rushing up to them and asked me what the heck I was doing. I asked them the same question back and told them they couldn't camp here and they had not asked permission to do so. This led to some laughter and protests saying that they were doing no harm and to lighten up. I told them to put the fire out and get off my land. I didn't want to risk a campfire there as it could easily get out of hand, especially when the group manning it were more than a little drunk. They ended up refusing, stating they weren't going anywhere and were not doing anything wrong, so I went home and called the police to get them off my property. They were made to leave and break up their camp. Am I the jerk for this? They probably thought it was okay as I'm good with letting people use my land in general. I maybe could have handled it better, but I'd gotten a fright seeing the fire and how they responded. It really just got to me. Dog walking and camping are two very different things. They should have asked for permission, and anyone who says lighten up when confronted with trespassing deserves to have the police called on them. Their entitlement and attitude is to blame, not you, not the jerk. Not the jerk. They literally started a fire on your property. This is how bushfires start, drunk people. Is it not illegal to start fires on other people's land? OP. It very likely is. I don't know all the specifics of the law, but the police were not amused when I told them what was going on and were quick to come over. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the neighbors? Please let us know. Why is it so hard for some people to just not trespass onto others' property? Am I the jerk for calling my brother a sore, slow loser? My wife, Irene, is very fit. She likes working out and has a proper exercise regime, etc. She believes that if she feels good, she looks good, and she feels good working out, so who am I to stop her? My brother, Will, spent the latter half of last year going through a messy divorce and now needs a place to stay. Though my brother and I aren't very close, I figured he would only stay with us a couple of weeks until he got back on his feet. Will is a typical gym rat. He's always on a very strict diet, always working out and bragging about his gains. I've worked out with him a few times and he's a little obnoxious. He's always mad at you if you don't work at his pace and is always trying to correct your form. He's a pretty fit and muscular guy, but I don't like to exercise with him. Will has been pushing Irene to work out with him because, according to him, she won't be able to keep up with him. Irene mostly just shrugs him off with a laugh and tells him she would love to work out with him. Irene works out in the mornings, three times a week, and then does a run in the evening, but she's been busy this past week and hasn't been able to stick to her usual schedule. Will thinks that she's making excuses because she doesn't want to be embarrassed by him. Again, Irene just laughs him off. About two days ago, Irene and Will went on an early morning run. I didn't go with them, but the first thing I heard when Will entered the house was, The only reason I couldn't keep up with you, Irene, is because you were sweating too much. I found this extremely comical and kind of just laughed him off. Irene rolled her eyes and went to take a shower, so I thought that the conversation would end. However, Will just kept bringing up my wife's sweat. My wife went to work and he told her, Make sure you don't sweat through your clothes. Or when she called him in the middle of the day, he yelled, Tell the sweaty jerk I said hi. Of course, the jerk comment aggravated me 
and I told him to knock it off and stop acting like a kid. I thought that was the end of it, but he just kept going. By the end of the day, I was tired of his comments, but Irene seemed rather unfazed by him. When she served him food, he made a comment about her sweating into the food. At this point, I was at my wit's end, and I told him to stop acting like a sore, slow, referring to his running pace, loser, and eat his food. Will of course got angry and said the only reason he was going slower than usual was because he was distracted by my wife's unhygienic sweat. Irene looked a bit offended by this, and I told Will that I would kick him out if he made another comment like that. He's been super upset ever since. I jokingly told this story to a mutual friend, and they agreed with Will. Maybe I shouldn't be so harsh. Update. I didn't expect this amount of responses. Thank you all for the advice. I've decided to kick him out. He will be staying at a nearby hotel now. Not the jerk. Your mutual friend is a jerk too. When you're a guest, you act polite or get out. I can see why he's getting divorced if he thinks insulting the host is okay. OP. It rubbed me the wrong way when he insulted her when she was serving him. Like, why would you insult the person that made your food and is currently holding your food? We now know why the divorce happened and why it was messy. Wow, not the jerk. Won't approve my purchases? Okay, I can work with that. I was a one-man IT shop at a small manufacturer. I had been there for years. I was actually the third employee ever hired and now the company was like 120 people. I was very frugal, but in smart ways. I got a lot done for a little money and always was looking out for the company. The owner recognized and respected this. Anyhow, we had gotten big enough where I didn't report to the owner anymore and I was assigned to report to an inexperienced accountant who got her degree from some sketchy online school. She was going to change the world. I used to be able to just buy anything I wanted because the owner knew whenever I asked for a company credit card that I had already done my homework and it would be good for the company. Well now, if anything was over $500, I had to go through this process with her to justify it. It wouldn't bug me, except that she had no real business savvy or common sense. It was just painful to me to try and explain the most obvious things to her and she would fight it just because of power tripping or something. Example, I was trying to justify having at least one computer loaded up and ready to go as a hot spare for when someone's broke. She balked at having $1,500 sitting on a shelf unused. I tried to explain that about once a month, someone's computer would break. All she could see was the $1,500 sitting unused most of the time. She couldn't understand the real cost of a broken computer, that the person could no longer do their job effectively, parts not getting ordered, jobs not getting expedited, emails not getting returned, me having to drop everything to react to this situation, overnighting in parts. The true impact cost to the company was several hundreds of dollars every month. She couldn't see that having a spare would pay for itself in half a year or so. After a half an hour of fighting over this, I had an epiphany. I handed her requisition approval forms to her, told her she was right, and left. Any purchases under $500 didn't need any approvals at all. Now, nothing I ever bought was over $500. I didn't buy a spare computer, I bought three, as parts, and assembled them into computers. Servers? Network storage? Why justify to a bean counter who wouldn't understand anyway? Just buy more parts and assemble yourself. Dual monitors for everybody, but one at a time. Explain to her that toilets typically have less than 20% usage, but when you need one... Fun fact, the typical car only spends 6% of its life being driven around. The other 94% of the time, it's just an expensive paperweight. And when her computer finally breaks, tell her... Sorry, we don't have a spare computer ready to go, so you'll have to wait while we fix this one. Should take about 5 to 10 days to get your computer working again. Shouldn't affect your productivity, right? I'm sure your supervisor will understand. Call me unprofessional? Okay, good luck finding another instructor. I realized today there are not enough stories on here about teachers and malicious compliance. So as a teacher of two decades, I decided it was time to write out mine. First and foremost, this is a story about a toxic workplace. This could happen in any business in the world. It just happened to occur in a school. Many, many moons ago, my school was having a massive shift in priorities and focus. We were a rural school, so new principal assigned to the building, pupils being redistricted, mass retirements, several people were being pushed out and run off by the incoming principal. A good number of people quit because of the toxic work environment, but I was not in a position to do so. 
At the time, I had a unique schedule. I taught mostly dual credit courses to juniors and seniors, but I also taught one course of students with SEN, SPED issues. The dual credit courses required a specific advanced degree as I was essentially teaching college credits in the high school. This detail will become essential later. At my school, we would be assigned support teachers to give additional help to students with SEN, SPED services. That support was not allowed to teach, but would typically share a classroom with the content teacher. I was usually unconcerned with who my assigned support was as I'm a laid back person who can work with just about anyone and I don't care about sharing a classroom. But there was one male support teacher who was not allowed in my room or near me in the hall, ever. For the sake of this story, we'll refer to him as Jerk. If ever a man knew how close he could get to harassment without crossing the line, it was him. Heck, sometimes he did cross the line. I made dozens of complaints, but nothing was ever done as I wasn't the target of his comments. The school year in question, Jerk was assigned to the most experienced teacher in the building. She was set to retire at the end of the year. Coupled with her no-nonsense attitude, the powers that be thought she could keep him in line. It took three weeks and she threatened to quit if Jerk was not moved out of her classroom. Fearful of losing another teacher at the start of a chaotic year, Jerk was assigned to me as my support teacher. I found out when he walked into my room, announced that we would be buddies now, and made a crude joke about how he could domesticate me. I immediately left the school sick and called my principal about the matter. He informed me in no uncertain terms that I could not refuse to work with someone just because that person made me uncomfortable. I reminded him of the previous complaints I had made. He snapped at me a bit, telling me he could not believe what an unprofessional child I was being. I was told to come up with a legitimate reason jerk shouldn't be in my class or shut my mouth and make it work. After hanging up the phone, the malicious compliance began. You see, I did have a legitimate reason. Because of a health issue I have had for my entire life, and during extended periods of stress and anxiety can really hurt me. I even carry medicine with me to lower my heart rate just in case. Step one was to call my doctor, who brought me in the very next day after I explained what was going on. She took my blood pressure, faxed a medical letter to my school immediately, and signed me out of work for six weeks since I had six weeks of leave earned at this point. Step two was to literally stop doing anything. Usually when a teacher goes out, Lessons are pulled from other members of the school who teach at the same content. Unfortunately for them, I was the only person in my building teaching dual credit. A few phone calls by my principal to the surrounding schools taught him what I already knew. I was the only person teaching these courses out of 11 high schools. There were no lessons to be found. I'm not sure what they gave my students to do during that time, but it surely wasn't the correct work. Step three was to let two or three of the parents know what was going on. I never directly told them, but a friend of a cousin of a neighbor might have heard about my health issues and passed the information along. Here's the point in the story where you think I'm about to tell you I enjoyed my six weeks paid vacation and went back to work, right? Oh no, the malicious compliance continues. A week before I'm scheduled to return to work, my principal calls me up. Standard well wishes about my health are extended, after which he says that he hopes the weeks away from the building have cleared my mind and helped me realize how hysterical I was acting. He continued by telling me that regardless of my feelings, I would continue to have Jerk as a support teacher. I asked him if he was ready to lose a teacher over this, and he laughed and hung up. Knowing that this was probably going to happen, I already had a doctor's appointment set up for phase two. Because my health issue is explicitly and clearly covered by the ADA, my doctor issued me reasonable accommodation paperwork to give HR. Essentially, I was to be allowed to teach in the least stressful environment possible, as determined by myself and my supervisor, along with a doctor's note restricting me to teaching duties that could be performed at home because of the excessive stress currently in the building. I checked with a lawyer to make sure my contract was airtight. It was, and I delivered the paperwork to the head of HR, whose kid I taught. I also contacted my college supervisor, whose kid I taught, to inform her that as of Monday, I would have been absent for more than 20% of the seat time for my courses, thus rendering those credits invalid. Over the weeks, she had pieced together what was going on, despite the school refusing to communicate any information with her, and she was furious. She may have told other parents what was going on, which resulted in dozens of calls to the school within a few days. By Monday, my accommodations were approved. 
I was allowed to teach my classes virtually from my home to save the embarrassment of canceling dual credit courses and I wrote out the year at home before transferring districts at the end of the year. I never spoke to or saw jerk again. Am I the jerk for refusing to add my ex-husband's name to the title of the bookshop I inherited from my father? Context. My ex-husband, Kevin, male 37, and I, female 35, got separated two years ago. We share custody of our two kids who are 9 and 5. My father owned a small bookstore in our hometown that I inherited recently. To be honest, the shop doesn't bring in a lot of money and I already have a stable income. Kevin found out and called for an urgent meeting. He came over to my place and said he wanted to talk about the bookshop. I said, what about it? And he told me that now that the shop is officially mine, then I should add his name on the title and split whatever profits I get 50-50. I was in shock. I told him he had to be joking, but he reminded me of when his dad passed and left him inheritance money that he ended up sharing with me. Therefore, I owe him half of my inheritance now. I didn't know what to say, but I mentioned to him that yes, he did share his inheritance with me, but that was while we were married. But now it's a different dynamic, and we no longer share anything. He got upset and argued that I technically owe him regardless of whether we're still together or not, and urged me to consider because the money will be going towards the kids anyway. We had a loud argument and I ended up saying that this will only happen in his dreams and telling him to wake up, then told him to leave. He tried to lash back, but I insisted that he leave. He had his mother call me saying that I lied, deceived and stole from her son in the past and I owe him. Not just that, but said that I should be rid of my pettiness and resentment towards Kevin and do the right thing for once. We fought on the phone and yesterday I was shocked when my nine-year-old son called me a thief out of nowhere. This escalated the fight because Kevin got the kids involved. I think that technically I do owe him because I can't deny that he shared his inheritance with me, but I think that now circumstances are different, like when we used to share our salaries, but now I don't expect him to do the same anymore, obviously. Still, I might be the delusional one. So, am I the jerk? Edit. He has no background in law, but says he knows his rights, which should be enough. He's actually the type that spell law L-A-W. Not the jerk. Unless you threatened him to get half of his father's inheritance, doing 50-50 was his choice. You don't owe him anything. But you need to be careful with his behavior and what he says to your kids about this. You might want to talk to a lawyer to get proof of everything. The demands, the parental alienation. Yes, document everything. The calls, the threats, the flying monkeys, involving kids. OP, you owe him nothing. He chose to share his inheritance. That's it, period. Even if you were fully committed, still, you don't need to share yours. Given that you're separated, he's insane. He chose to share with her, and they were married at that time. That is not the situation now. OP, you don't owe him anything, and to involve your son is reprehensible. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for not letting my nephew blow out my son's candles? I'm 21, male. My son turned four last Sunday. As usual, we had a small party at my mother's house, and we invited my brother, who's 30, male, his kids, who are 8, 6, and 5, and my sister, who's 27, her daughter, who's 4, as well as some neighbors. Usually, when it's one of the kids' birthdays, all of them blow out the candles because that's how mom used to do it with us. Yet, ever since my kiddo turned 2, he has refused to do so. Last year, when his cousins had to blow out theirs, he didn't participate, and when his birthday came, he didn't want anyone to participate with him but all of the other kids ended up throwing themselves at the cake and did it anyway. I kid you not, my son cried for the rest of the evening and refused to eat his cake. My sister talked to her daughter about how that wasn't right, but my brother said that my son was a little wimp and he had to learn how to share. We stopped talking for a month after that until my mother forced us to make amends. A week ago, I told them that their kids weren't allowed to blow out the candles with my son. My brother didn't like it, of course, and my sister-in-law said that she was going to explain it to her kids and that it was okay. Fast forward to the party. My girlfriend comes with our kiddo's cake. We gather around the table and we sing happy birthday to my boy. When he's about to blow out his candles, I notice that my nephew, who's six, is about to do it too, and I cover his mouth with my hand. My kid didn't notice, blows them out, and jumps straight to his mama's arms all happy. My nephew starts to cry and tells my brother that I didn't let him do it and it's not fair. My sister-in-law tries to explain to him something, 
but my brother comes right at me for not letting his kid have fun. I remind him that I told them my son was going to do it alone, but he says, that's not how we do it. And I told him, well, that's how I do it now. If you don't like it, you can leave. My mom is telling him that I'm joking, but my brother took his kids and leaves. My son is obviously confused, but ends up playing with some other kids and forgetting about it. My mom says that I'm the jerk for doing this and that my son has to understand that this is our way and is forcing me to apologize. My girlfriend and sister say that I'm right because it's my son's birthday after all and I don't know what to do. ETA People, I get it. We shouldn't be blowing out candles. I'll do better next time. That wasn't the question though. Not the jerk. Good job covering for your son. Your brother and sister-in-law are clearly in the wrong for not teaching their kids basic manners. The brother is in the wrong for calling OP's son names. Who calls a kid something like that? Notice the ages too. The brother never had to share his birthday candles when he was four because his only sibling was an infant. I bet he loves this tradition because he's the one who started it, blowing out his younger sibling's candles when he was four, five, and six, and they were infants or toddlers that couldn't compete. Am I the jerk for telling my brother to go ahead and sue my husband for breaking his hearing aid during a prank? Context. My brother, 23, is a college student with a hearing disability. My parents got him a $4,000 hearing aid to be able to hear properly. So last week, while my husband, who's 32, and I, who am 26, were visiting my parents, my husband hid my brother's hearing aid as a prank and it got damaged in the process. After looking for the hearing aid for hours, my husband handed it back to my brother while laughing in his face about how freaked out he looked. He didn't know how delicate this type of device is and ended up breaking it while hiding it. My brother had a breakdown and started yelling at my husband and threatening him with court if he doesn't pay up for a new hearing aid. My husband didn't think he was serious and laughed him off. I was mortified to say the least. I told my brother to do it. Sue my husband if he had to. My husband side-eyed me and said, All right, princess. Two days ago, my husband came home and was full-on panicking, saying my brother is going through with his threat and is suing. I shrugged and remained calm and collected. He started yelling at my reaction, then urged me to call my brother and tell him to back down, but I said no. He did this to himself and deserves no sympathy or advocating for me. He was shocked. He yelled that it was just a prank with no intentions of hurting anyone, then shamed me for not taking his side. Moreover, he said that my brother only felt confident in suing him after I encouraged him by telling him to go ahead and sue. We had an argument, then I went upstairs and stayed in my room. He must have called my parents because he later complained about them deciding to stay out of it and let my brother sue. He then complained about how this is going to affect us both since he doesn't have that kind of money to give to my brother. This morning he blew up at me, saying me and my family are a bunch of sad pathetic jerks who can't take a joke and are willing to easily drag others to court and ruin their relationship with them over a couple of grand. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. That's not a prank. Imagine taking someone's prosthetic leg or walking stick and hiding it. It's not funny. A prank would have been hiding his car keys or house keys, not something worth thousands that helps him here. I can't believe he didn't offer to cover the cost anyway. That's what the decent person would do. You are absolutely not the jerk, and I hope that this situation doesn't get too messy for you. You want more details in my weekly status reports? Okay, here you go. Enjoy. Back in the early 2000s, I worked as a software engineer on a team of software engineers. What this meant was that I spent a lot of time writing code, fixing bugs, defects, glitches, etc. The company software releases goes in cycles and regularly goes into a cycle of fixing bugs for weeks at a time. My boss does a weekly status report that he sends out to his boss and some of the other middle management. He writes a team summary and then includes all of our status reports that we send him by copying and pasting. When we're in one of those bug fixing cycles, my status report looked like week of month, year, worked on fixing bugs. Q first malicious compliance. Boss asked that I provide more details. Now my status reports looked like week of month, year, worked on fixing bugs, list of bug numbers, one, two, three, and four. Q second malicious compliance. Boss had a sit down meeting with me and talked about better details than just bugs, even though that's all I and the rest of the team have been doing. We had a small argument on this where I told him that if I provide more details, no one's ever going to read it anyway. That didn't go over well with him. 
He basically told me that if it's related to the actual work, put it in the status report. My new status report looks like week of month, year, day one. Working on bug one, two, three, four. No clue. Went to break room for coffee. Ended up talking to John about bug one, two, three, four for 30 minutes. Then talked to John about the bug he was working on five, six, seven, eight for another 30 minutes. On the way back to my desk, bumped into Jane, who asked me for help about the bug she was working. Spent 20 minutes in the hallway talking to Jane. We were both clueless. Got bug 2345 assigned to me, but I'm still working on 1234. Both are high priority. Everything is high priority. Continued working on 1234. Went to lunch with Jack and Jill. We ended up discussing the bugs we were working on for over two hours. Got some ideas to pursue. Ideas didn't pan out. End of day. We'll resume tomorrow. Basically, I did this for each day of the week and then sent it to my boss. He promptly asked me to summarize my week. I said, worked on fixing bugs. He never asked me about status reports ever again. Grown men who act like 12 year olds. This customer last night, he wasn't even rude or anything. It was just the way he was acting. It was absolutely unbelievable. So I get apps and drink orders from a three top. Give them another five to 10 minutes and then pop over to ask if they want to put in entree orders. Guests three and two were fine. She got the salmon, well done. He got the scallops. Guest one, presumably guest two's husband, isn't sure what he wants yet. Guest two proceeded to read off every meat on the menu and asked me if we had any other red meat options besides fillets. No, we don't. The only other options we have besides fish would be the pork chop or a lamb loin, both of which are very popular and very delicious. The whole time I'm describing either of these dishes, guest one is shaking his head. No, I don't like pork. No, I don't like lamb. You only have fillets. I don't like fillets. Guest two, the wife, proceeds to start reading every option on the menu and the whole time it's going like this. Guest two, rotisserie half chicken? Guest one, no, I don't like chicken. Lamb loin? No, I don't like lamb. Pork chop? Scallops? Salmon? No, I don't like pork. I don't like fish. No seafood. I don't like seafood. Barbecue chicken salad? Steak salad? No, no salad. I don't like that. He eventually ordered the meatball appetizer as his meal. The whole interaction probably took 10 minutes and I got set with two more tables during this. So I ended up upset by the end of it because this man has an inability to eat food like a normal human being. That's all. I wonder what this dude eats on a daily basis. I also wonder how his wife puts up with it. If I went on a first date with a guy and he pulled that crap, I would laugh, get up and leave. How do you go out with someone who acts like a picky kid? That's when you assert yourself when you see the first table set and say, I'll give you the time to make your decision. I'll be back. Then go greet your next table, then return. If they try to stop you, go to the next table anyway. You have to control the situation as a professional. One person is not more important than all the rest. OP, you are absolutely correct. I should have removed myself from the situation and let them deal with it while I greeted my other tables. It was like watching a slow motion car wreck, honestly. The cheerleaders can break dress code because they're school uniforms? Guess I'm wearing mine. Way back in 2013, I was a sophomore in high school and there was a tradition that on Fridays, the cheerleaders, football players, without their pads of course, band members, and the other groups performing wore their uniforms to class. This wasn't a written tradition, and only the cheerleaders and dance team's uniforms broke dress code. Nobody really batted an eye to it. I wasn't a skirt person, but I liked dresses once in a while. As one can tell by my user, I grew up in Texas, and it's still significantly hot in August and September. So, one time while wearing a casual sundress in September, I was pulled out of class and reprimanded because the end of my dress was four inches from the knee, when the dress code said no shorter than two. I pointed out the cheerleaders and dance team uniforms every Friday and how they reached mid-thigh at the longest, but was told that was okay because students can wear official school uniforms and was sent home to change. Clearly, somehow, someone had forgotten I was on the golf team. Immediately, my mind was turning to the next Friday. The school had recently upgraded the golf team uniforms the year prior, and the girls' team uniforms consisted of a short-sleeved collared polo shirt and a skort. If you don't know what a skort is, it's essentially a skirt and short shorts combined. It looks like a skirt, but they essentially act like built-in bike shorts, and these were short. I'd argue shorter than the cheerleaders. 
So that next Friday, about three days later, to my parents' surprise, I was ready to go that morning in my golf uniform, as compared to taking a bag to keep the clothes in to change into after school. But I just said, Fridays, we can wear uniforms to class, and they accepted without question and took me to school. Well, by second period, I was sent to the office yet again, and the first thing the assistant principal asked me was why I would deliberately disobey her right after our last conversation and threatened in-school suspension. I'll never get anywhere in life by not listening, yada, yada, yada. When I finally had a chance to get a word in, I said, but this is my school golf uniform, and I pointed to our school's logo that was sewn into my polo shirt. You said students can wear official school uniforms to class. Why are the cheerleader uniforms okay and mine isn't? This isn't even a skirt. It's a skirt. It has pants. I still remember how upset she was. She stared me down for what seemed like a millennia. Then she snapped and told me to get out of her office and go sit in the lobby area. That I knew what she meant and she would be calling my parents about this blatant disrespect. So I waited and played on my iPod and chatted with a nice secretary trying to keep myself distracted because in reality, I had really been trying not to cry. I had massive anxiety when it came to authority, but I still had my naive sense of injustice, and I didn't want to just let this go. After about 20 minutes, she popped her head out, and in a very monotone voice, told me I could go back to class, and to let teachers know I had gotten permission from the front office to wear my uniform. Then she went back in and closed the door before I could even think to respond. I spent the rest of my day dealing with teachers questioning me about my outfit, and one or two calling the front office to double check my claim that I had in fact gotten permission and went to practice after school as normal before being carpooled back home. My dad met me at the front door with a small smirk and I asked him what in the world happened because I knew he was the go-to contact for my school, so I knew she called him. He explained that when she called and tried to get him to come up to the school and get me and talked about punishments for my insubordination, he immediately began to argue with her and admitted he raised his voice quite a bit asking why I wasn't allowed to wear my sport uniform that the school provided to me as a dress requirement at my golf practice, and mentioned taking this all the way up to the school board and resolving this obvious favoritism. He then asked me not to do that again, but that he was proud of me and told me, I know I had told you never to start a fight, but to always fight back. I always thought physically, but you dang sure took the advice. Karen demands my upgraded seats for free. She really ends up regretting it. This happened a few years ago, before lockdown, when flying overseas from the US to Europe. My girlfriend and I were taking a trip to visit a few places in Europe for a vacation. This was her first time overseas and the first time she had ever flown on a long haul flight of more than a three or four hours. In the lead up to the trip, we decided to upgrade our seats from economy to whatever the premium economy variant was for the airline. Seeing as this was my girlfriend's first time on a long flight, I figured it was worth the upgrade for the extra room and perks. In total, we paid around $150 total for both of us to upgrade. We boarded the flight and we got settled in our seats, which were in the last row of the premium economy section on the right side of the plane. There was no noticeable division or indicators between sections other than a small plaque above our row said premium economy or whatever. My girlfriend took the window seat and I sat in the aisle. Entitled mom and her son who was around 9 to 10 years old, then board and are seated several rows behind us, but in the middle row of the aircraft, 242 seating. Her son has his nose buried in his switch, as you'd expect a kid of his age to do. They barely get to their seats when Entitled Mom comes up to our row and stares at us with no greeting. She's standing in the aisle as other passengers are trying to get around her to get to their seats. Entitled Mom, Can you swap seats with my son and I? He likes having a window seat and we don't have one. My girlfriend and I look back at where her son is sitting and then at each other. I try to politely decline her request. Me. Unfortunately, no ma'am. We paid to upgrade to these seats, so we'd like to keep our assigned seats for this flight. Entitled mom keeps staring at us for a couple seconds. More people are awkwardly trying to shuffle around her as she stands there. Entitled mom. My son is not a great flyer. He does better when he can sit next to the window. Me. Sorry, but like I said, we paid more money to sit here in premium economy. We're in the last row, so perhaps there is someone else in the rows behind us who would be willing to swap seats. At this point, a flight attendant noticed that Entitled Mom is holding up the boarding line and comes over to tell Entitled Mom to take her seat. She goes back to her row 
and my girlfriend and I think that this is the end of that exchange and go back to getting settled. After boarding completes, Entitled Mom and her son immediately stand up and walk to our row, standing right in front of us with all of their stuff in hand. The kid still has his face buried in a switch. Entitled Mom. Can we swap seats now? Me. Ma'am, I already said that we aren't willing to swap seats. As I've said, we paid more so that we can sit here, so we'd like to keep these seats. Awkward infinite pause. Karen, that's really just selfish of you. My son isn't the best flyer and likes to have a window to look out of. It's not that big of a deal for you to take our seats so he can have a window. At this point, I should mention this was an overnight flight, so there isn't going to be anything to look at except darkness for a majority of the flight. Me. I'm not going to argue with you, ma'am. I don't think it's selfish to want to sit in the seats I paid for. I'm sorry you don't have a window seat for your son, but that doesn't mean you're entitled to our seats that we paid an upgrade fee for. Entitled Mom continues to stand there silently for a few seconds, as if we'd give in eventually and move if she didn't leave. I'm guessing you don't have kids if you're acting like this. Me. Ma'am, I don't know what to say to you at this point. If it was that big of a deal for your son to get a window seat, then you should have done so in advance. Did you try asking anyone else if they were willing to swap seats? Well, no one else back there is traveling together, so they aren't going to want to swap. I turn around and see an older couple in the row behind us, a pair of co-workers in another row that were watching a video on one of their phones while laughing and a middle-aged woman sitting alone in the aisle seat with the window vacant. Entitled Mom then starts to open up the overhead bins to start putting her stuff in there. Me. Ma'am, we are not swapping seats with you. I think you're just trying to guilt us into giving up our seats so you can sit in premium economy. If a window seat was really that important, you would have moved on and asked other people behind us once we told you we weren't willing to move. You just want us to give you a free upgrade. Entitled Mom becomes furious at this point and continues to call us selfish and how what I said wasn't true. She then starts to bend over and grab my stuff like she's going to evict us from the row. Me. Lady, please don't touch any of my stuff and leave us alone. Thankfully, the flight attendant comes up to ask what the problem is. Entitled Mom tries to go on a rant that we were denying her kid a window seat and were being selfish and rude to her and her son. After she was done ranting, I explained the actual situation to the flight attendant. Flight attendant. Ma'am, they aren't obligated to swap seats with you. They said no. You need to take your seats now. Please go back to your row. Flight attendant escorted them back to their seats as Entitled Mom huffed and puffed. She then spent the rest of the flight glaring at us from the aisle seat. When the plane finally landed, she rushed to the front of the aircraft ahead of everyone and gave me a solid bump as she passed by me with her bag. Definitely wasn't an accident. Her kid was fine for the whole flight too. Anytime we saw him, he was either asleep or was heads down playing his switch. I think the only way to deal with people like that is to not argue. They ask for something, just say no. Don't give a reason. Logic won't work with idiots anyway. If they start on about how their kid needs this or that, I just say, this may come as a shock to you, but I don't give a hoot about your kid. Am I the jerk for telling my husband that I was disappointed in the gift he had for my son's 16th birthday? Background. I've been married to my husband, Jack, for three years. I have a 16-year-old son from my previous marriage, and Jack has an 18-year-old son from his previous marriage as well. My stepson and my son aren't close, and they only see each other while they visit but everyone is happy with these arrangements and there are rarely any issues. My stepson's 18th birthday was a couple of months ago. I wasn't at the party since his mom hosted, but Jack told me he bought him a car because he's been needing it since he has a disability and will be going to college. I saw the pictures. The car looked nice. Now my son's 16th birthday took place this past week. My son and I were both excited for the gift Jack said he'd bring and I hinted to my son that it would most likely be a car just like the one his stepbrother got recently. It turned out we were wrong, because at the party, Jack's gift for my son was actually a gaming console. My son got so upset that he went to his room and shut the door mid-party. Everyone noticed something was wrong and left shortly. Jack looked confused this entire time and asked what the deal was. I asked if he really didn't know and he just stared. I told him that my son was expecting something like a car as a gift. Jack asked why, and I told him because my stepson got one for his 18th birthday recently. I bluntly told him that my son was rightfully disappointed and so was I in the gift and really thought it was unfair, especially since my son told his friends he was getting a car from his stepdad. 
Jack argued about the difference in circumstances, saying his son needs the car to drive to college, while my son doesn't need it, and besides, he doesn't have a disability like his stepbrother and can walk or commute. Also said I shouldn't have assumed it would be a car, and I messed up by hinting this to my son. I couldn't help but notice the difference in treatment. I let him know that no matter how he tries to explain his reasons, my son will always feel like he's less than his stepbrother, in a way, and what happened now will make it worse. Even between the stepbrother, not just him and my son. Jack called me unbelievable and said that I should feel ashamed and then rushed out. He's expecting me to get involved and ease things between him and my son, but I decided to give my son time to process this. Am I the jerk for what I said? You're the jerk. Why don't you and the child's father buy a car for your son? Your husband is not obligated to buy his stepson a vehicle. Your stepson did not get a car at 16, he got one at 18. To expect your son's stepfather to buy a car for him when the kid is two years younger would make you the jerk too. I feel sorry for your husband. He married someone who only wants him for his money. Your son expected a car because of you. Why in the world would you hint at that and then put that expectation in his head? Your husband is not responsible for buying your son a car. You and his father are responsible for buying your son a car. You're the jerk and you set your husband up to fail and potentially ruin their relationship. Not to mention that a game console is a really generous gift and Jack showed no gratitude. Of course you're the jerk. Jack bought his son a car and then you expected him to buy your son a car without ever even talking to him about it and just telling your son that it would. Your son is your responsibility and 18 is different than 16. College is different than high school. He didn't even get his own son a car at 16. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Hope this guy got a prenup. Yowza. My ex-wife is trying to break our daughter and her boyfriend up so that she can start dating the boyfriend's dad. Me, 45 male, and my ex, 35 female, have a daughter named Alana who's 16. Alana has been dating Eric, who's 18, for about 8 months now. Things have been going well for them. My ex is active in Alana's school community and recently met Eric's dad, who's 44 male, at a recent school function. From what I understand, they hit it off and were moving in the direction of seeing each other. That is, until Eric's dad found out that my ex is the mother of his son's girlfriend. He thought things would be weird and awkward if they started dating, so he made it clear to my ex that they were no longer a possibility and why. My ex did not take it well. According to what Alana told me later, her mom came home drunk one night and started mumbling at her about how she was a burden who always ruined her happiness. The next day, ex either didn't remember or pretended not to remember and thanked Alana for taking care of her when she was drunk. But it didn't take long before my ex started telling Alana how she didn't think Eric was right for her. They've got a two-year age gap and will be separated for at least that long when he went to college and that it would be better to break it off now. Alana was upset and they got into a fight, bad enough that she came to spend the night at my place. I told her that her mother was full of it and as long as the guy's not treating her wrong, it's none of her mother's business who she dates. Things calmed down for a bit before suddenly escalating. Instead of simply telling my daughter it would be best to break up with Eric, X started actively trying to sabotage the relationship. Examples include telling Alana she saw Eric with another girl, talking up and trying to introduce Alana to one of her friend's kids, and even stealing Alana's phone so that she could use it to text Eric that they were done. After resolving the misunderstanding with Eric, Alana had an even bigger fight with her mother before finally getting the reason why she was doing this. She wanted to get together with Eric's dad, but he wouldn't be with her because the kids were dating. Alana lost it, called her mom a crazy jerk, and came back over to live with me. When I got the full story, I was livid. I called my ex to ask her what she thought she was doing. She said her love life wasn't any of my business. I told her I don't care about her love life, I care about our daughter. Then I asked her why, if Eric's dad wouldn't be with her because of the kid's relationship, would she think he would be okay with her breaking the kids up? She called me jealous and said he wouldn't know if I didn't tell him. I called her a crazy jerk just like Alana did and hung up. Now, not only am I getting texts from her calling me horrible, but also her sister and her friends, who I assume don't have the true story, calling me the same. I try to ignore them, but it did get me thinking about whether I went too far when I lost my temper. I'm not a 16-year-old like Alana who can't filter their thoughts from their mouth. Am I the jerk? Edit. 
I don't really have enough time to just go through this and respond to individual comments. There are a lot more than I expected. So I just thought I'd address something that I see keep popping up here. Unlike some of you are assuming, I did not make my ex crazy or emotionally stunted or some nonsense because we met at a bar that carted at the door. I assumed she was older than 21 and because neither of us were looking for something too serious, we didn't get too personal. We just hooked up. I didn't find out how old she really was until after she was pregnant. We decided to try to seriously get together for the baby and got married. It didn't work out and we divorced after about four years. Now, I'm fine if you judge me based on that info that actually exists, but please don't go making up some crazy stories about how I'm some kind of a bad person without any proper context. Not the jerk in this case. Alana needs to tell Eric everything and ask that he pass it along to the dad to put an end to this Lifetime movie. Not the jerk. That's crazy behavior. But why did you have a kid with a 19-year-old when you were 29? Sounds like you both are red flags. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his ex-wife? Please let us know. That Karen sounds bonkers. Keep all the accidental tickets? Sure thing. So I work in a food-to-go department in a semi-large grocery shop. Up until a couple of years ago, it was owned and run by a real jerk of a man. Let's call him Boris. He was picky, arrogant, rude, etc. He was only in for a couple of hours a day, but would then be monitoring the CCTV and calling in every five minutes to tell someone to do something. And even worse, a couple of the managers would brown nose very hard. They'd side with him, say we were sneaky in our own department and probably were stealing. Anyway, in my department, we would serve people their food and they would put it into their cart and have to pay for it along with all the rest of their groceries at the checkouts. We didn't handle money. We would just use a computer that would tally up their items and produce a barcode that we could stick on their food. Now, the way the computer worked was anything we typed in, even if we canceled it out, would still be transmitted to the checkout system so the shop could record what and how much of each thing is selling. This meant, though, that items people never actually bought were still being transmitted and recorded as sold, but no transaction or money ever followed. For example, someone comes to food to go order several different items and I tally it all up, only for the customer to change their mind and not want the food anymore, price put them off, or any other customer is always right BS. Or sometimes customers just wanted to know how much a certain combination of food would cost, so we'd type it all in regardless of if they go through with it. This meant that Boris thought either the customers were shoplifting food or we, the staff, were stealing. I don't understand that logic, but I digress. To tackle this issue, we were told to start recording every single time items were input to the system, but no food was actually making its way to the checkout. Every time someone wanted to know the potential total, we'd print a ticket. Every time we mistyped or pressed the wrong button, or a customer changed their mind, or they wanted to add on more or remove something, we printed that ticket. By the end of the day, there would be dozens if not hundreds of tickets being recorded. Every day, we brought a page covered front to back in stickers to the office for the manager to go through. Their hearts sank every time. They had to painstakingly go through the sales and cross-reference with the codes of the tickets to make sure there was no stolen goods. This was an added job that was not quick, on top of an already huge to-do list the managers had there. Sometimes several days or weeks worth would collect before they got to it. A few months in and this new process was abandoned. I don't know how they got around it, but another six months later and Boris sold the shop. Am I the jerk turning away a woman knocking at my door in the middle of the night looking for help? I fully admit that I don't really think I did anything wrong and this is ridiculous to me, but my partner is angry and thinks I'm the jerk. Maybe I am. Around 1.30 a.m. today, a woman who neither me or my partner have ever seen before came knocking at our door. I admit she was acting upset. She said that she was looking for her boyfriend. It's snowing and cold outside in the middle of the night. My hackles pretty much instantly rose. I've heard stories of people knocking on doors and faking distress looking for houses to rob. My partner, on the other hand, is ready and willing to let her in and try to help. Help with what? Her boyfriend is not here. He has never been here. I tell her not so nicely that he's not here, that I know what she's doing, and that she needs to get off my property now. Now we're up. It's almost 3 a.m. and still arguing on and off about me being a jerk to some poor innocent woman who's just worried about her boyfriend. I don't understand what we could have done. Whoever this dude is, he certainly hasn't been in our place. If she's cold and upset, maybe she should go home and file a missing persons report. 
on her own phone at her own house. My partner argues that maybe she might have been homeless. Her boyfriend may have mental problems that are weighing on her, so she can't do that. And all of that is a true possibility. I spoke harshly because I don't believe her at all, and that if anything else even mildly suspicious happened after that door closed, I would be willing to call the cops. I did not verbally threaten to call the cops, nor did I actually do it. I think my partner is naive. My partner thinks I'm heartless. The truth probably lies somewhere in between. Am I the jerk? Edit. They spoke at the door for at least three minutes before I interjected. She asked multiple times to come inside and not once for someone to call the cops to help her find her boyfriend. I'm personally reluctant to call the cops in any situation because of possible escalation. My partner outright did not want me to do so because he was worried it might get the woman in trouble. No cops for anybody, even if I regret that part now, if only because it might have saved one of my neighbors from the scheme. Edit 2. I called the non-emergency line to report it this morning and I have regrets. Why the heck do the police need to know my full name, including middle and date of birth, to tell them about some suspicious jerk? Oh well. Not the jerk. As much as I would want to help out, I wouldn't do this either. That's sketchy and it's frankly not your problem. You don't even know the person very well, which is also a red flag. Better safe than sorry. At 1.30 a.m., that woman was looking for her boyfriend, and she's looking for him by knocking on strangers' doors? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't searching for anyone involve asking your friends and family members, asking work colleagues or college or school classmates, reporting to the police? What exactly will she or anyone else find at a stranger's house? Not the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP? or their partner. Please let us know. The reason the cops ask for your personal info is for their records. Those records, including your phone call to them, are accessible to the public, so always keep that in mind when you give them any information. You can also tell them you'd like to remain anonymous. Am I the jerk for telling my husband that he needs to come straight home after work to help with the kids? I'm 35, female, and my husband, who's 38, gets off of work at 8 p.m. It takes about 15 minutes to get home. Every single night, he gets home between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. I've noticed that he goes to the grocery store almost every night, and a lot of times it's for things like lotion or dog food that we really don't need because we will already have dog food at home. He also says that he likes to decompress in his car, listening to music and playing a game on his phone for like 10 or 15 minutes. We have three kids. One of them is an infant, and I could really use his help at home. Around this time, I'm trying to get the baby to bed, trying to get the older ones cleaned up and finish their homework. And when he comes home, this close to nine, he barely gets to see the kids and he doesn't eat dinner with any of us because we've already eaten. I've offered a compromise, asking him if he could just do the decompression like a couple of nights a week or if he could come straight home and decompress after the kids are asleep like I have to. He told me that if he comes straight home that he's going to need 30 to 60 minutes of decompression time and then he's going to go to bed, basically saying that he will not spend any time with me. He's telling me that I can't compromise because I want him to come straight home and that I'm telling him that he's a bad parent and a bad husband because he's choosing to not spend this time with his family. He also likes to take one or two hours every single day off so that he can drive around and listen to music and play a video game on his phone. I understand wanting time to yourself, but every single day? Especially when it's making your wife's life more stressful? Am I the jerk with my request? He told me that his therapist said that individuals need time to themselves but I think that this amount of time is selfish and it's making things more stressful for me. Update. He says if he decompresses after they go to bed that he needs to get back in the car and go back out to drive around. I asked point blank if he was cheating or drinking and he accused me of only wanting to be with him for financial stability. I also worked until five months ago and said he wants a divorce. Also found out he often closes 10 to 20 minutes early, but he never gets home any earlier. Not the jerk. He can't tell you that you're unwilling to compromise when you asked him to please don't do this every single day. Yes, we all need me time, but he seems to only care about him, not you or his family. What does your therapist say about that? OP, I haven't spoken to my therapist about it yet. That's Monday. Not the jerk. I would be on his side if he was literally just taking 15 minutes a day, was fully engaged with the family while home and made sure you got free time too. But coming home late, plus driving around randomly up to two hours a day? That is being a bad parent and a bad husband. OP. It's one to two hours driving around on his own on his days off. 
and then every day after work, getting home between 8.30 and 8.45 when he gets off between 7.50 and 8 o'clock. I've even asked him if he can decompress after the kids go to sleep like I do because this is a very stressful situation. Tell him that if he wants one to two hours of decompression time each day, then you also deserve the same amount of time. And so the compromise is working out a schedule so you each get the same amount of alone time. Not the jerk at all. He's taking one to two hours a day to drive around and an extra 30 minutes or longer to come home each night. You're doing a full-time job taking care of the kids. He's working a full-time job, which means that the time he is off work needs to be split up so you each get a break. Not the jerk. He obviously doesn't care for spending time with his wife or kids. Are you sure he's only playing games or listening to music in the car? Either way, it's really crappy of him and he's not prioritizing his family at all. Just bringing home a paycheck isn't enough to be considered a good father and husband. Everyone sucks here. You both suck somewhat. You for completely disregarding what he and his therapist both see as important time for him to take and him for not being very willing to find some way to compromise towards your needs also. If he gets off at 8 p.m., can he do more of the childcare early in the day so you could use that time for yourself? His work schedule kind of sucks for the nighttime routine, but if that's what the job is, then you kind of have to accept that he won't be home for dinner time or whatever. You're the jerk. You sound like a gym to be around. Seems like you refuse to take some time off yourself and expect him to sacrifice his time as well. OP, I'm just asking him not to do it every single day, and I do take time off. It's just very periodic due to his work schedule and all of his time to himself. So you're tripping over what, four and a half hours a week? You're being really petty and seeing your responses, I can see why he doesn't want a break. If I was him, I wouldn't want to be near you either. OP, 30 minutes, five times a week. Plus, let's say about an hour and a half on each day off. So that's about two and a half hours plus three hours. So about five and a half hours total. And it's not about the time away, it was me really asking him if he could come straight home because the time that he takes away is the most stressful part of the day for me. I asked him if he could please do it another time. So first it was the amount of time and now it's when he takes the breathers? My guy could be there 24-7 and you would still find something to complain about. OP, it doesn't sound like you read the initial post. I said in the initial post that I asked if he could either take his decompression a couple nights a week or if he could come home and help and then decompress afterwards. I did read it, and it came off as controlling. Y'all need couples therapy. You need to realize how hard being a stay-at-home parent is. He is intentionally decompressing during one of the most hectic times of the day and is holding her hostage about it. There is absolutely no reason he can't come home, help with the kids, then sit on his own with a beer for 15 minutes, then still relax with his wife and watch a show. There's nothing controlling about OP's request. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I might get downvoted for this, but I don't know, I, I kind of feel bad for this guy. Am I the jerk for not wanting to invite my daughter to my wedding? When I, 36 male, was 19, I was hooking up with Sarah, 36, and we got pregnant with Chloe, who's now 16, female. Me and Sarah weren't in a good spot, but we went ahead with the pregnancy, but our problems got worse. We fought constantly and weren't close with each other. I was the only one working and felt like I was being used. There was a lot of resentment and I ended up cheating when Chloe was too. It wasn't right at all. I should have just left. I was 21 and immature. We got split custody and ever since it's been brutal with Sarah. She undermines me and won't consult me on decisions. Doesn't stop her friends or family from crap talking me to Chloe. When Chloe was 11, she found out I cheated on her mom and has been a nightmare since. She would lock herself in her room and give me the silent treatment. She would basically only speak to me to ask when could she go back to her mom. This started at age 11 and went on for four years. Chloe kept saying horrible things to me. She banned me from attending her life events. The final straw was when I started dating again and she messaged a girl that I posted a picture with, saying how I'm a cheater and a jerk. After that, I was done. I texted Sarah congratulating her on her win. Our daughter hates me and doesn't respect me, how I'm just done with it. I'm not taking Chloe anymore because I'm tired of being treated like crap. And if Chloe hates me, then I don't think it's best she'd be around me anymore. I said I'd still pay till she's 18, but I'm done being a punching bag. That was two and a half years ago, and I haven't spoken to Chloe since. I'll send her a birthday card, but that's about it. Well, about two years ago, I met Kristen, 29, female, and she's amazing. We are set to get married this summer. When forming the guest list, she asked about my daughter. She's aware of the situation. 
I told her that we don't have a relationship, so I don't see the need to invite her. Also, it's a special day for us, and I don't know what my daughter is capable of anymore due to Sarah. I don't want her ruining anything or causing a scene. I thought that the matter was settled. I get a call from Sarah, and it's her screaming at me, saying Chloe was upset that she found out through Facebook that I was engaged. I told Sarah that the relationship between us is her fault, and that she shouldn't be surprised. Chloe got on the phone and started yelling at me, saying I never support her anymore. I said she banned me from her events, called me a jerk every day for three years, so she shouldn't be shocked that I don't want to be talked to like that, and that I do support her, I pay child support, I pay for her car, and I pay the lion's share of her private schooling. So she should watch what she says before implying that I don't support her. The conversation started to deteriorate, so I simply said, Chloe, I can't trust that you won't do something, and this is a special day for me. So if you want to reconnect, then maybe another time and place. My fiancé is supportive, but I kind of feel like a jerk. Am I the jerk? Everyone sucks here. You're a jerk for a lot of reasons. You already know this to some degree, but I can't sympathize with anyone that completely cuts their kid out of their life like that, regardless of the reason. You made no mention of getting her into therapy when she was younger to help her navigate this or trying to get more custody due to the parental alienation that was occurring. What did you do to help your kid who was, and is, living in a toxic environment like that? Your ex is a jerk for obvious reasons. I'm not going to go so far as to call your daughter, who was only 11 at the time, a jerk, but she sucks too for her behavior. However, she got a crap deal here. Parents who hate each other can't be civil and treat each other like crap. Parents who put her in the middle. Parents who don't support her or help her. There's more to support than money. And a parent who completely cut her off and abandoned her. I'm not saying inviting her is the right thing here, but your issues started long before now. This is just one more way you've shown your daughter that she's not really all that important to you. You can argue this all you want, but if she was truly important to you, if you truly loved her, you would have been talking about the therapy you got for her when she was with you and the efforts you made to help her rather than abandoning her and cutting her off because it was too hard. Your analysis is poor. You completely ignored the main culprit, parental alienation. Therapy is not the magical solution to everything. If Sarah turned her kid against her dad, at 11 years old, by telling her that her father cheated on her and therefore broke up the family, it will have a huge impact on his relationship with the kid. There's no good reason for Sarah to tell her preteen daughter about her relationship woes with her father. It was done out of spite. Not the jerk. The mother is responsible for destroying the father-daughter relationship. The father and daughter are dealing with the long-term fallout. X shouldn't have told the daughter the truth. That doesn't remove responsibility from OP. OP didn't do anything to fix the situation. He went no contact on a kid instead. He still paid child support till she was 18. The verbal, emotional, and mental mistreatment is enough to go no contact. And yes, kids can mistreat their parents too. I don't give out parent of the year awards for paying child support. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his ex? Please let us know. I think they should all go on the Jerry Springer show. Oh man, would that be a good episode. Especially when they bring out her new boyfriend who's three foot one. Karen's sister stole my iPad. She ends up really regretting it. I'm 17, female, and my sister, who's 15, has the habit of taking things from my bedroom and keeping them or losing them. My father has talked to her, grounded her, made her pay them back for it, but she just doesn't listen. My mom always takes her side and makes excuses for her. My dad had enough, so he bought me a small safe, against my mom's wishes, and I keep some jewelry, makeup, my diary, and gifts from my boyfriend, who's 19, Caleb. Caleb comes from an upper-class family, and he's always buying me stuff. Most of it gets stolen by my sister, but the most precious gift I have from him is an iPad Pro he gave me for my 17th birthday on February 14th. I love to draw. It's my hobby, my form of expression and how I relax. I used to do it on my laptop, but since Cal gave me the iPad, now I can do it in my free time during classes, in the train, or the garden. I have more options now. Cal also made a custom case that he painted with a lot of things for me. When I'm out of home, I leave it in my safe because it's one of the only things I don't want to lose. And to be honest, I don't want my sister putting her hands on it. I spent two days at my brother's, who's 21, apartment planning my little sister's birthday party. When I came back, I went to take the iPad to sketch some ideas but I only found the case. I thought I had left it somewhere else, but I was sure I didn't. I also never took the case because it's my favorite thing. I looked around my whole room, 
my dad's office and the garden since I'm usually there all the time. I also called Cal and asked if I left it in his house, but he said no. When my family came back, I was awfully crying in the kitchen. My dad asked what happened and I told him I couldn't find my iPad. My mom said very lazily, your sister lost it on the train yesterday. I asked, what? And she said, your sister took it to school and lost it. Accidents happen, let it go. I was livid. I said that my sister opened my safe, don't know how, and stole my tablet. My mom told me to shut up and to never call my sister a thief again. My dad got involved and after much fighting, he said that my sister had to pay me back. My sister just said that she didn't have money and attempted to go to her room. So I told her that I'll take the money for her party and just keep it for my iPad. She came right at me and told me that I couldn't do it. My mom sided with her and demanded the money, but I said, no, she owes me. I get to keep it and ran to my room. My father said that I could do it and buy another one. My brother transferred the money a few hours ago and it's sitting in Cal's account because I don't have one yet. My sister has been crying because she just lost her sweet 16 party and says a tablet is worth much less than that. ETA, my brother is coming home in around 20 minutes to talk to my parents. I don't know why, but it might be about my sister. Cal is also on his way here to install the lock. ETA, my brother took my parents and my sister out. I'm at home with Cal right now. He already installed the lock and we're looking to buy some safes. Update, my brother just left. Apparently, my sister has been stealing from him too when she goes to his place. She admitted to just keeping the things to herself and that sometimes she can't help it. She acts before she can think about it. She admitted that she took my iPad but claimed that her intention wasn't hurting me. That's why she left the case. She was planning on taking it to school, bragging about it, and then returning it since it was way too expensive and for once didn't want to take the risk. But apparently she did lose it or someone took it from her bag because she swears she didn't sell it or anything. I mean, after this, it's just pointless to keep lying. She went to her room and came back with a bunch of things, some mine, some my brother's, and some that belonged to our cousins and her friends. She even had one of Caleb's rings. We don't know how she did all of this, and she refuses to give that information. She also refuses to tell me how she broke into my safe. My parents are outside talking alone, and my dad let Caleb spend the night here with me. Not the jerk. If she cared about her sweet 16 so much, she shouldn't be stealing. OP. Maybe she didn't think it would be related to that. To be honest, this is my first time snapping, so it's new to all of us. She's coming to the age where people will be able to have her arrested for stealing. She needs to learn that she can't just take crap from you. If she doesn't have the money to replace what she's taking, her grubby little hand shouldn't be on it at all. Taking her party money is the lightest punishment she could serve for this crime. Even a used iPad is worth enough to be a larceny charge if she steals from the wrong person. Also, change the combination on your safe. And put locks on your bedroom door and a camera in your room. OP. I don't think I'll be allowed to have a camera in my room. My dad said yes to the lock though. Have you ever had someone steal something from you? If so, what was it? Please let us know. A dude named Trevin stole my holographic nine tails when we were in elementary. He's no longer alive. Am I the jerk for being too close to my ex-husband? Six years ago, I got divorced from my now ex-husband. There was no drama that led to this. We simply realized we were no longer happy or in love, so it would have been a clean break if not for the fact we had a daughter who was now 11. Neither of us wanted to lose full custody of her or miss important moments in her life. She's the most important person in both our lives, and we debated on trying to make it work just for her, but realized that would only lead to all three of us becoming miserable. So we entered an arrangement that many would view as unconventional. When we sold our house, we used the money to buy two semi-attached houses that were joined and had a door installed between them. The construction company tried to warn us against this as it would affect resale value, but neither of us had any intention to sell, so we had them go ahead with it. We also had them take down the fence between both our back gardens so our daughter would have an extra large back garden to play in. Many of you may balk at the door, but there is an agreement. It's strictly for our daughter's use and neither of us can use it barring any emergencies, say a fire, a medical emergency, or something being wrong with our daughter. She also has two bedrooms, one in each house, and every day she can pick where she wants to have breakfast, dinner, and sleep. I won't lie, it was awkward at first, but for her sake we made it work 
and even regained a lot of the friendship we had lost, though it was of course strictly platonic now. Last year, my ex-husband married his girlfriend of three years, a lovely woman who I'm actually friends with, and I was even a guest at their wedding, with my daughter being one of her bridesmaids. All in all, it's an arrangement everyone is content with, except for my boyfriend, who I started to date two years ago. He understood the arrangement entering into the relationship, and while he said it was a bit weird, he never protested and all seemed well. Things are getting more serious, and we've been discussing moving in together, and he has made it clear that he wants me to move, as he doesn't want to live next door to my ex-husband. I understood, but told him that wouldn't be happening, as my daughter had to come first, and our arrangement gave her a stable upbringing. He got upset with me and asked me how he was supposed to be a father to my daughter when she already had a dad and he was literally a wall away. I won't lie, this took me by surprise as I had no idea he wanted to be a father to her. I told him gently but firmly that he wasn't her father, that she already had one and that even her father's wife didn't try to be a mother. Instead, she is called by her name. I told him if he wants some kind of familial title, he could be an uncle, but I wouldn't give him permission to take her father's title when he is very much involved in her life. He told me if I loved him, I'd move for him, and despite me trying to tell him I do love him, he isn't listening. Am I the jerk in this? Not the jerk. Sounds like you very clearly explained how things work in your world. Kudos for coming up with a unique parenting method that puts your daughter firmly as the most cherished outcome of your previous relationship. Your new boyfriend may not be compatible with your uniquely blended family. Bit of a red flag that he wants to appropriate the title of father. Good on you for nipping that in the bud. Well done, carry on. Without him, if he can't get the brief. OP. Even my ex-husband's wife doesn't get called mum or any variation of that. She is called by her name, and when my daughter is feeling particularly affectionate, a nickname. So yeah, I wasn't going to let him be father. Not the jerk since you were honest with him from the beginning, and your boyfriend's you don't love me arguments seem to be his ego and insecurity speaking. Not gonna lie, but love the fact that you two put the love for your kid and her having some stability before your own egos and needs. Hope you have the strength and mental sanity to keep doing that, even if that would mean breaking up with your unreasonable boyfriend. Do him a favor and break up with him. He isn't going to be happy. You and your ex did this thing, and your ex is lucky he found someone who didn't have a problem with it. You may not be so lucky, but that is a chance that you're taking doing this. It's hard to move on, and most people are not going to want to pursue a relationship with this kind of arrangement. That works for you, and you're happy with it, then that's good. There's no way to compromise here. You aren't budging, so break up with this guy and let him go. Actually, I would argue that hopefully any emotionally mature adult would see the beauty in this arrangement. Imagine getting involved with someone and you see firsthand how well they resolve such an issue and how they are able to make an unusual decision that ends up being the best for everyone involved. OP sounds like a catch to me. Not the jerk. Girl, run. Any man who isn't okay with you being close to your ex is a control freak and insecure. I always stay close to my exes and I've never regretted it. Trust me, I've dated tons of guys and the best relationships I've had were with secure men who didn't care what I did with my exes. Men need to realize we aren't their property. To be honest, I have hooked up with some of my exes on certain occasions just to spite a jealous boyfriend I had at the time, then made sure he found out to hurt him. Yowza! I know it sounds bad, but all my girlfriends do the same thing. You don't have to go as harsh as I do, but please don't settle for a loser control freak like most of these guys are nowadays. Well, don't you sound pleasant? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. Sometimes if you really love someone, you have to let them go. Hey Karen, have I told you how much I love you lately? Don't even think about it, Reddit boy. Just load the darn trailer. I used to work as quality assurance slash control at a flour mill. For you to sink your teeth into your sandwich of delicious fresh bread, three things have to happen. One, flour has to be made. This happens at a flour mill. Two, flour has to get to the bakery. This usually happens by trailer or truck. The trucking company, usually a separate company or business from the flour mill, has to put their trailer up to the scale and get loaded. Then they drive it to the bakery. Three, bakery. 
where they make that high-carb goodness with crusts that your kids hate. One day, I get a call from one of the bakeries we serve. Um, we unloaded the flour today, and our cameras got a bunch of dough balls going into the silo. Unacceptable. How can this happen? Trucks have to be washed every three to four weeks. If the trailer is not dried properly, then it retains some water from the final rinse. It mixes with the flour, creates dough, and delivers a subpar product. It causes a fermentation reaction. For some reason, since I'm quality control at the mill, everyone looked at me to fix this problem, which is really a problem with the trucking company and the wash stations they use. But I rose to the challenge. I called a meeting of the trucking company, the mill, and the bakery. I told them what was going on, explained that it was unacceptable, and came up with a plan. Before loading, every freshly washed trailer has to be inspected by me or someone else on quality control. We will not load trailers that the mill quality control does not release for loading. They all quickly agreed. Great idea. I get congratulated on fixing the problem. Until one Monday morning. We were supposed to load a trailer at 3 a.m. I was not supposed to be working then, but I came in just to inspect and sign off on the trailer. Delivery was at 7 a.m. It's a three-hour drive to the bakery. Bob, the driver, was running late. I was getting mad kept thinking of my bed and how I should be sleeping. Bob shows up at 3.30 a.m. with the trailer. Darn traffic, let's load this quick. Maybe I can still make it. Hold on, I have to inspect it. No, you don't. I have to make this delivery. Bob, I'm inspecting the trailer before we load it. Insults ensue. He starts making colorful accusations of my mother and my entire ancestral line. I ignore him. I climb up on top of the trailer, soaking wet. I can see water on the bottom. The entire trailer was damp. I come down. Bob, we can't load this trailer. It's wet. You need to dry it. Drying takes about 25 to 40 minutes, depending on the weather. More insults. Finally, he says, No, I'm not losing my job to bureaucrats who have no idea what traffic is like. I'm not drying this trailer. You're going to load the trailer, and I'm going to be on my way, like I've been doing for years. I was so tired and I had a short fuse. Bob, are you going to dry the trailer? No. Malicious compliance ensues. Okay. I went to the head miller on site. I told him that the trucking company is refusing to dry the trailer. I'm not wasting any more time here. I've done my job, I inspected the trailer, I'm going home and I'm going to sleep. I left. Bob found out I had left and he said to loaders, great, now you can load me up. They informed him that they couldn't load freshly washed trailers without quality signing off, and now no one is here to sign off. So sorry, you're going to miss the delivery. Bob called his boss. He complained that we were refusing to load his trailer. His boss called the head miller, who explained, per our agreement, quality couldn't sign off on a wet trailer. And since Bob refused to dry the trailer, quality's job was done. They inspected the trailer. There wasn't going to be another inspection, since the trailer was not going to be dry. So, quality left. The trucking company. You need to call the bakery and tell them. They wanted the mill to take the blame. Oh, don't worry. We will be sure to call. And the head miller told the bakery what happened. The bakery fired the trucking company. Bob got fired from the trucking company. I got promoted. Just kidding. I didn't get promoted. Somehow, my manager still blamed me for it. Something about using creative solutions. But nothing ever happened to me because of this incident. I don't care. No regrets. Am I the jerk for having my stepdad walk me down the aisle? I'm 27, female. My biological dad, who's 62, left my mom, who's 60, when I was 10 months old. It was a whole convoluted ordeal, but things boil down to, one, my mom had postpartum depression after having my brother, who's 31. Two, she recovers but gets worried when pregnant with my sister, who's 29. Three, my dad cheats on my mom a few times with a coworker while she's pregnant with my sister. 4. After my sister's born, they separate for a few months but come back together, though they continue to have trouble. 5. I'm conceived to save their marriage. Spoiler alert, I did not. 6. Mom begins an emotional affair with my stepfather, who's 58. 7. I'm born. 8. Biological dad leaves for good and files for divorce. 9. Mom moves me and my siblings in with my stepdad. 10. Divorce is finalized. My biological dad was not a big part of my childhood. He was always cold with me compared to my siblings and kept trying to prove that I wasn't his kid. We've had DNA tests done. I am. 
My brother and sister have always had a good relationship with him. On the flip side, I have a great relationship with my stepdad. He's been more of a father to me than my biological dad my entire life. My siblings are much colder to my stepdad because they think of him as being the person who split my parents up, which he's not. The dissolution of the marriage is on my mom and my biological dad, and they're much better off apart. In the past few years, I've reconciled with my biological dad, and we do have a relationship. I'm currently planning my wedding with my fiancé, who's 33. My sister is going to be my maid of honor, and my brother is one of the groomsmen. I was going over plans with my sister and mentioned that my stepdad would be walking me down the aisle. She was upset, started ranting about how I'm ungrateful and a bad daughter to my biological dad. She left in a huff. A few hours later, I got a call from my biological dad saying he won't be coming to the wedding if he's not walking me down the aisle, how having my stepdad walk me down the aisle would humiliate him, and how if I care about him, I will let him walk me down the aisle. I told him that I'd rather not have him be there than to not have my stepdad walk me. He hung up on me and has been cold since. This has split my family. My sister's on my dad's side. My brother says he won't get involved. My mom and stepdad have told me that they think that I should let my dad walk me to keep the peace, but my fiancé and I agree that we'd rather have me walk down the aisle alone than have him do it. I'm getting a lot of messages from my biological dad's side of my family calling me out and telling me that I'm the jerk for depriving my biological dad of this. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. It's your wedding. Not your biological dads, not stepdads, not your mothers or your sisters, period. Your wedding should be a joyous affair and it sucks that your family is flipping out rather than being supportive of you. OP. Thank you. Unfortunately, things get really dramatic when my mom and bio dad are involved in anything together. Holidays are fun. The best part of being an adult with crappy parents? Not your problem anymore. Your presence is a gift, not a given. Well, who do you think OP should have Walker down the aisle? Her biological dad or her stepdad? Please let us know. Make sure someone records a video specifically of stepdad walking you down the aisle. I know bio dad is going to love to see that. Am I the jerk for not taking my niece to France? I, 37 male, live in the US with my 36 female spouse. She's American and I'm French. We both didn't want kids and didn't have any. And we enjoy our life this way together. We have nieces and nephews we see occasionally during the holidays or family gatherings. We just came back from a family visit that ended up in some arguments with our relatives over taking our niece, who's 17, to a planned trip to France to hang out with my family for four weeks during the summer break. By any means, our niece is a good kid. We watched a couple times at our home or theirs when her parents needed to be out of town and couldn't take her. She listens to us for the most part, but there are things she just doesn't do and gives us some attitude about when asked to. Like taking her shoes off, not eating on the couch, asking adults for food instead of snacking, staying at the table until the end of the meal, waiting for everyone to start eating, setting the table, asking if she can watch TV instead of turning it on at will. These may seem like minor trivial details, but they are not where I come from. Arguing with adults over this type of trivial thing is not even a thing in my family. No fault of our own. Culturally, kids are raised differently here and there. And I'm fine with it, but this is also why I don't want to bring her with us on the trip. My sister has a big property with farm animals, a bed and breakfast, and all the kids are used to doing chores and don't argue because it's a communal thing we do together. Her property is a classic French small castle gym and there's always something to do. We plan to drive to a couple wine places, visit friends, and we would need to leave our niece in the care of my sister. I already know the way my sister plans days for her kids will be a problem to my niece and I don't want to burden her with that. She's making her home a welcoming place for over 18 family members plus the guests in the bed and breakfast throughout the summer. We just do what she tells us and help where we can because she's the host. It's the way we've done it since forever. So when my brother-in-law asked if I could take our niece on our trip to France, I said no. He insisted I ask my sister before I answered and I said that I wouldn't. I asked that we talk in private and not in front of the kids to explain why to him. He started screaming, so I answered why, mentioning that French families operate differently and it wouldn't work for anyone. I know for a fact that my sister doesn't want any of it. She hosted an American exchange student once and didn't have a good time at all, and it was around the property work and chores. Now, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, mother-in-law, and father-in-law are upset and trying to get my wife to make it happen 
for the sake of our niece. Am I the jerk for not wanting to take my niece to France? Not the jerk. If they want her to go to France, they should take her. You are not obligated to do this, period. It's not your kid. Not the jerk. It's your vacation. Them asking is fine, but when you said no, that should have been it. You'd have to have her with you for four weeks and have your sister babysit her as well. It's unfair to be asked to do that. You decided to not have kids for a reason. What an amazing opportunity that would have been for a 17-year-old. What a shame for her that she hasn't been taught to be a better guest. But she hasn't, so that's that. If you're not comfortable inflicting her on your sister, then there's no way you are obliged to. Your brother-in-law is astoundingly oblivious and entitled to yell at you and try to force this, which shows exactly where your niece got her attitude and gives you no way at all to be confident that your niece would even try to be better or more respectful if she did go. At 17, if she can't handle being told, no, you can't go to France with your aunt, then that's proving the point even further. Not the jerk and don't ruin your trip by caving to pressure. Am I the jerk for saying my husband's family tradition made me feel like a glorified surrogate and not wanting to participate? My husband's family have a tradition that makes me feel like a glorified surrogate. Essentially, when someone has a baby in the family, the husband and the grandfather both give the mother a substantial amount of money. The way my husband explained it to me made it seem like it happens immediately after giving birth. When he told me, I made a face and he asked me why. I said that this tradition made me feel like a glorified surrogate and it was like he and his family were buying the baby from me. My husband got really offended and said it was a nice thing his family did to the new mother and that in a few months I should just thank his dad and not say anything negative about this tradition as it was important to them and him. I told him I wasn't sure I wanted to participate and now he's upset and thinks I'm reading too much into it. Am I the jerk? Why are people saying not the jerk? I'm sorry, but yes, you actually are the jerk. You're reading too much into it. It makes no sense to buy the baby from you, and I have no idea why you thought of it that way. Have you never heard of a baby shower? Or just in general, people with newborn babies getting gifts that would help the family out? Even if they didn't need the financial help, you could just set the money aside to use it whenever you want to buy your kid something, or even to use it for their education. This is a nice tradition because it means the father's family is invested in yours and wants you and the baby to live a comfortable, happy life. I don't know why you have such a negative feeling about that. They're just trying to do well by you. You're the jerk. I know. She's probably just one of those people that's able to find a negative in everything. The whole thing sounds like an amazing gesture and tradition. Here, new mom, you've worked so hard at creating another human being and we want to gift you a large sum of money so that you can treat yourself. What jerks his family are. You would be the jerk for sure. How is that any different from getting gifts when pregnant or a family member setting up a trust for the baby? They're giving you and your baby a gift, not buying the baby. Not the jerk. This is honestly a major red flag. You aren't a dog that is to be rewarded for what you've done, so why are they treating you like one? Men think they can get away with this kind of crappy behavior because they feel above us. I would seriously reconsider this relationship unless you want to be treated like a dog for the rest of your life. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband and the in-laws? Please let us know. Tell you what, if you don't want that money, I'd be glad to take it. Maybe we can work something out. Am I the jerk for wanting a room in the house I'm buying? For context, the house my, I'm 20 male, family lives in was owned by my grandmother, 57 female, and great-grandmother, who's 88. My grandmother passed last year and the house solely became my great-grandmother's. She's willing to sell the house to us for $50,000 with a deadline. The original plan was for the house to go into my mother's name, who's 40, but the bank wouldn't approve her for a loan. My stepfather, who's 36, tried as well and he wasn't eligible either. With the deadline approaching, we tried to see if I could. I'm currently in the process of doing it, but I have gotten further than both of them did. That leads us to the issue. I'm currently living in the house in the formal living room with a partition as my only form of privacy. I've been contributing to paying bills since before this, whereas my brother, 18 male, has not when we both have jobs. We used to live in the same room, but when I went away for college, he got the room to himself and I won't fit in there anymore. I've been trying to get that room for a little while now, especially since it's right next to the front door and my brother has a tendency of just randomly inviting friends over. With the fact that I am now taking a huge financial risk to save us from losing the house we have lived in for over 10 years, I told my mother that I want the room. 
I'm trying to get her on my side since I know my brother is going to fight tooth and nail to keep the room. She isn't completely on my side and has told me that she'll think about it whenever I've asked her. I brought up my situation with a few of my friends and coworkers, and they all believe that I should get the room, some of them saying that I would have the power to kick them out if I wanted to. I don't want to do that since the only reason why I'm doing this is for them, but I do want to be able to have my own privacy. So please tell me, am I the jerk? Update. I read a lot of messages and some of them were saying to have a legal agreement on the payment to ensure that my family would help contribute. I spoke with my family and they have agreed to sign rental agreements where each of them will be paying rent equating to a quarter of the mortgage, allowing everyone to pay an equal share. As for legal advice, my legal counsel is my mother since she has a background in paralegal. As for the room, I spoke with them about it and after much discussion and argument, we have decided to create a room out of the garage and my brother actually jumped to moving in there, which shocked us. So that takes care of the main point of the post. I wanted to thank everyone for giving me advice and the strength to stand up for myself. My mom actually got scared that I was going to not get the house when my brother flat out declined giving me the room in the first place and I straight up said that I won't go for it then. It's going to take some time, but I will get the room and I won't be taken advantage of with the payments being able to fight it. Don't buy the house. This will only end in disaster for you. The families seem like nightmare tenants that'll only cause headaches for the OP. Not the jerk. Don't buy the house. Or if you do, make sure you have a formal agreement drawn up by a lawyer for your parents and brother being your sibling. Not the jerk. I agree with the others. Don't buy the house. Your family will never see you as the homeowner. Save yourself a lifetime of grief. Well, what do you think? Should OP buy the house or not? Please let us know. Sometimes we love our family so much that we make decisions that will hurt us in the long run. Absolutely not. I really hope he changes his mind. Am I the jerk for not wanting to sit at the kids' table? Last weekend, I, 22 female, was at a family party at my aunt's house to celebrate my cousin's, her son, birthday. It was a nice time as always, and when it was time to eat, I got my plate and started heading downstairs where everyone was gathered since the kitchen is upstairs and the family room is downstairs. Anyway, my aunt rushes over and asks me where I'm going. I said downstairs like everyone else, and she told me I had to sit at the table so I wouldn't spill anything or make a mess. I didn't like this because I'm 22 years old, and I know how to not make a mess, and also because the only people sitting at the table were my three little cousins, who are 13, 10, and 6 years old. I told her again I didn't have to sit at the table, but she stood in front of me and blocked my way downstairs, so I just gave up and sat with my little cousins. Someone told my aunt the cooler was out of water, so she went back in the kitchen to get more. Since she couldn't see me, I decided to go downstairs anyway. About five minutes later, she comes downstairs and sees me sitting on the couch eating and demands for me to go back upstairs to eat at the table. I tried to remain respectful, but I said I was too old to eat at the kids' table and I didn't understand why I was expected to eat with them when my sister, who's 24, didn't have to. My aunt just huffed and went back upstairs and eventually sat down with her own plate of food. She seemed a little upset about it the rest of the party. In the car on the way home, my dad said I should have just sat at the kids' table and listened to my aunt because it was her house. I didn't respond because I didn't want to drag the issue out, but I thought it was ridiculous that they were making this such a big deal. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Sounds like she wanted a free babysitter for her kids. That's exactly what she wanted. A 22-year-old sitting with the kids while her 24-year-old sister sits with the adults. Aunt just wanted a free babysitter for the younger kids. Karen tried to control my diet, so I kicked her out. My friend, Jen, got laid off a couple of months ago. She's currently staying with me to save money until she finds a new job. Jen believes her being overweight has caused her to have low confidence, which then caused her to lose her job. Therefore, she decided to go on a diet to lose weight. I'm in full support of her decision, as I figured, regardless of her reasons, it can't be wrong to lose weight and be healthy. Jen downloaded an app that tells her what to eat and what to not eat, and she is not supposed to eat candy and other sweets. I like sweets, but to support her, I've stopped having cakes, milkshakes, etc. at home. The only sweets I have at home are candies. She said to me that candies were too enticing to her and I should get rid of them. But I need candies. They help me concentrate while I'm working. I work from home, and candies have been part of my diet for years. To accommodate her needs, I told her that I would not eat candies in front of her and I would keep my candy in my bedroom, 
which she should not have access to. She got upset, saying I was not being a supportive friend, but I said I was being supportive, as I have made enough accommodations to make sure that no foods forbidden by her diet were accessible or visible to her. She was still pouting. This morning, when I came back from my daily run, I found her in my bedroom searching for stuff. I asked her what she's doing. She said she needed to find my junk foods and throw them away. This was completely unacceptable to me. For one, we agreed when she moved in that she should not enter my bedroom without my permission. I don't have a big apartment and my bedroom is the only place where I can have some privacy. And she breached that agreement. And two, I do not believe she has the right to throw away any of my belongings. At this point, I told her if she couldn't respect my space and my routine, which do not affect her, she needed to leave. She threw a fit, accusing me of abandoning her at her most difficult time. But I explained that I wasn't kicking her out for no reason and that she's welcome to stay, but she would need to respect my boundaries. Am I the jerk here? Update. Thank you everyone for your comments. I really appreciate your insights. After our argument this morning, Jen went somewhere to clear her head. She just returned and we had a conversation. She asked me if I really wanted to kick her out. I said, not exactly. My intention was mainly to remind her of my boundaries, but if those boundaries keep being breached, I would really need her to leave. She said she understood, but she realized that her staying here for too long would jeopardize our friendship and she would not want that. She will find another solution to her living situation. Not the jerk in any way. You were nice enough to host your friend while she tries to get back on her feet. You were also kind enough to accommodate her requests about junk food in common and shared spaces. The violation of your privacy by going into your room in and of itself would be enough to kick her out. This is on her. OP. Thank you. She wasn't happy when I told her that she couldn't enter my bedroom without asking because before she moved in, she was allowed to do whatever she wanted when she visited me. But it's different this time. She basically lives here now. I need to set some boundaries to protect my privacy. She could not be more wrong and has completely violated your privacy. What you eat is none of her business. You actually shouldn't have even given up what you did, cakes and milkshakes. You were too nice and that might have been slightly enabling to her kind of crazy. Part of her weight loss journey is going to be learning how to live in a world full of food she chooses not to eat. Also, I don't believe she was going through your room trying to throw that stuff out. She was going to eat it. Not the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. Here's a solution. Give all your candies to me. Problem solved. My boyfriend and my brother lied to me for eight years. Context and a very short version. When I was 17, I was in a relationship with my twin brother's best friend, Jake. It lasted eight years till we were all finished with college and my ex had gotten enough money off his extremely religious parents to get a head start in life. If you don't know where this is going, my brother and Jake were together the whole time and used me as a cover because my feelings didn't matter. My brother had been out since his teens, which is why they came up with the idea to use me so his parents wouldn't get suspicious. My parents were angry with my brother, even cut contact for a year, but they all made up and have been pushing for us to speak since. I refused to speak to my brother due to how they dismissed me when everything came out. Jake literally said, you wouldn't understand. I had no other choice. My brother was worse. Like, I get where Jake was coming from because his parents are nuts, but I didn't deserve to be treated like that. It's been five years since everything came out. I'm currently pregnant with twins with my soon-to-be husband. My brother and Jake moved back to our hometown last year. They have both been trying via my family and friends, even coworkers, to get me to talk. My mother begged me to sit down like an adult and don't let the past ruin my son's chance at having a relationship with her uncle. That my grudge I have against my sibling is ruining our family and my mental health. A few hours ago, I stopped by for lunch and to show my parents scanned photos. Guess who was there? The happy couple. I was literally in shock for a few minutes. Then when my brother tried to hug me, I pushed him away. I got so worked up, I physically couldn't stop shaking at this. My brother and Jake tried to apologize talked about what happened and begged for a relationship. I was in tears and begged them to leave me alone. In the end, my brother handed me a letter and said, I really wish things could be different. You're my sister, my twin. I do love you and it hurts me that we don't have each other anymore. So basically, I'd lost it, ripped up the letter, screaming that we weren't family and I just want him to leave me alone. I walked out after that 
and had to get a taxi home because I was too upset to drive. Since then, my parents and family members have told me I'm cruel and bitter and that I need to stop living in the past and get over it. Hey guys, I won't be replying anymore because I'm very emotional and don't feel well. Not due to anyone in this sub, you're all amazing. But someone gave my brother my number and with my family's non-stop calls, I'm gonna have to turn my phone off for my own sake. And before anyone asks, my fiance said in the family group, if anyone shows up at our home, they'd better hope the cops get there before he answers the door. I'd like to answer a few questions a lot of people keep asking before I go. After eight years, why didn't you see any signs? Basically, my brother and ex were always close, and I obviously never thought that they'd do something like that to me. Like, your brother is meant to protect you from the bad guys. What kind of relationship did you and Jake have? We lived together for two years, and we did everything a normal couple does. So I hope that clears up a lot of curiosity. Why are you more angry at your brother than Jake? I will never forgive Jake, but I did and still do pity his situation with his parents. The reason I'm more angry at my twin brother should be obvious. What do you plan to do with your parents? As of now, I will go no contact till my babies are born and at least three months old so I can be in the right headspace. Are you in therapy? Yes, it helped me love myself again and trust people. I'm in a way better place than I was a few years ago. Not the jerk. I feel sorry for Jake with his parents, but what he and your brother did to you is horrible. They betrayed your trust, both as a romantic partner and as a sibling. If they had told you the truth at age 16, you might have even offered to be a cover. But instead, they chose to lie to you for eight years. No one, not your brother, not your parents, no one gets to determine when you should be over it. You are not obliged to accept any apology ever. And tell your parents if they can't respect your feelings and your decision, they will no longer be part of you or your children's lives. OP. I've actually been asked this multiple times. The honest truth is, if they had told me the truth from the get-go and asked me to be his fake girlfriend, I probably would have done it so my brother could have been happy. They took that choice away from you. You do not owe them forgiveness. Not the jerk. They are monsters. They stole eight years from your life. Because there were like no other options. Now they're sorry. Yeah, right. Maybe they want something from you, like being their surrogate in the future. I would stay no contact with them and low contact to no contact with your parents. You did not break your family, they did. Now they're harassing you and putting your well-being in danger. Forget them all. Be strong. My parents got my older brother a car for his 18th birthday, but did not do the same for me on mine. Okay, I know the title sounds like I'm spoiled, but hear me out. My brother, who's 20, got a car for his 18th birthday. Not a new car or anything. It was a 20-year-old Lexus that was in pretty good shape, and he rubbed it in my face for the rest of the time he was a senior in high school. Compared with my brother, I get just as good of grades as he does, better in some cases even. I worked my hardest in the hope of fairness. I even did some volunteering cleaning up garbage in my local area. Then my 18th birthday came and went a few weeks ago, and the only thing I wanted the only thing I was hoping for was a car. I wasn't expecting something like a new car or a sporty car, just something reliable like my brother got. The party wasn't anything like my brother's 18th. For his 18th, my mom baked the cake herself. It was a delicious layered chocolate pudding cake. I got a sheet cake from the supermarket. For his, they got a DJ. For mine, it was my dad's old boombox with a couple of mixed CDs. We went through the whole party and I figured my parents might have just been waiting to spring a surprise gift on me, but that didn't happen. I asked them as things were wrapping up why there was no car when my brother had got one, and they said that they felt like he had worked harder for it. I asked what he did that I didn't do, because I did all of that and more. My grandma was nearby and heard everything, and then she asked them why as well. She ended up lecturing my parents that she was very, very disappointed in them for showing favoritism. Then she proceeded to announce to everyone still there that my parents thought it was fine to get their firstborn son a car and a DJ, but not their second. And then she even pointed out how much harder my parents tried for my brother's 18th birthday than they had tried for mine. My uncle was the first to stand up and say something, then everyone else who had not left yet. I ended up just walking away and going to my room to sit and think. I got a few I'm sorry calls from relatives and my grandparents convinced me to go out with them for the evening. But when I got back, my parents were upset and told me I'd shamed them to the whole family. I just walked past them because I didn't want to fight. 
The next few weeks went by with a silent treatment between us. But then a few days ago, my parents suddenly surprised me with a white 98 Subaru Legacy that runs great. They practically threw me the keys and the title in an envelope and said to have fun. I got the car, and they're paying for insurance for the next six months like they did for my brother. I know a car isn't really a right, but a privilege, so I feel like I've essentially blackmailed my parents into getting me one. Am I the jerk for how all of this played out? Edit. I would like to clarify a few things. My parents make pretty good money and also don't go out of their way to live lavishly by choice. They've always been moderate in everything they buy or do. Though, if anything is stretching their finances, it's my brother's college tuition. He got a partial scholarship and my parents are paying the rest. I don't and never intend to ask for the same treatment on that. I want to work and pay for my own student loans. Now that I have the car, I'm already looking into getting a part-time job. This also isn't a gender thing, as I'm male like my brother. The bill of sale for the car I got says my parents paid $1,600 for it. My brother's car cost them about $3,000 if I remember. But I don't see it as a money issue. I actually really love the Subaru and told my parents so. They did not share my enthusiasm. I also did try to talk about a car with my parents a few times last year, but they always dodged the conversations about the topic. I figured if I talked about it too much, I'd ruin it. And so I stopped. I would have felt like a brat to keep talking about getting an imaginary car, so I learned to just stay silent and hope. I can't go stay with my grandparents because they live in a one-bedroom condo. There isn't enough room for other people. After all their kids grew up, my grandparents decided to downsize to make their eventual retirement easier. Also, my grandparents know all of the details already, and they tell me that I didn't do anything wrong and were already planning on confronting my parents quietly over the car issue but they took the chance to take care of the matter when they heard me asking my parents about it. As for my brother's 18th birthday party, it was held in 2020 during basically the height of the lockdown. Honestly, we shouldn't have had a big party like that at the time, but my parents insisted. As for my brother himself, he barely speaks to me, even before he left for college. He didn't show up for my 18th birthday party, and I figured that's just because he's busy with college and he's not even in the same state as us anymore. Honestly, I haven't seen or heard from him since Christmas, and even then, the most I got out of him was a mild greeting. I did thank my parents for the car, enthusiastically thank them, but they've barely said a word to me after giving me the Subaru. Even when I thanked my parents, they brushed me off and just went inside. It kind of gave off the vibe that they were letting a brat play with his new toy, which was pretty upsetting, and one of the reasons I made this post. Edit 2. There was one more thing I forgot to say. I was really hoping to get the car because I literally couldn't get a part-time job without one. We don't live in the city, and we're 10 miles from the nearest public bus stop. I've always had to get rides to go anywhere. Now that I have the Subaru, I intend to look for a part-time job after school as soon as I can. Can we give it up for your grandma? She's a G. I would have been bummed out too if my siblings received a car and I didn't. Cars are expensive. Did your parents explain why you weren't initially getting a car and why no effort was being put into your birthday? Not the jerk, by the way. Not the jerk. The way they got called out by the whole family is hilarious. They're mad they got caught. Good on you, OP. Not the jerk. Clearly favoritism here. When I was in high school, my parents helped my older sister get her license at 16 and gave her a car to use, and they did the same with my younger brother. This sucked because I had middle kid syndrome hard and I had better grades than them, played two sports a year, worked 15 to 20 hours a week, and was going full-time to a local community college through a program we had, so basically graduating with my associates at 18, and they didn't. I definitely could have used the car to drive myself to everything, but instead relied mainly on the school bus, public transportation, and my boyfriend. This was over 10 years ago, and I still get upset with the favoritism. Your parents are mad at you, even though they have just caused lifelong resentment. My girlfriend demanded to wear a white dress to a wedding. This happened during the weekend. Me being in my early 30s and my girlfriend in her late 20s. I was invited to a wedding ceremony of a colleague and could bring someone with me. I asked my girlfriend that I've been dating for a year if she would like to join me and she was really happy because she apparently loves weddings. Since we don't live together, I drove to pick her up so we'd have some time to spare before the ceremony. As she comes out, she looks really beautiful and has obviously put in time to fix her hair and makeup. She's also wearing an off-white dress that was rather ornate. As she got in, I told her that she looked stunning, but I asked if she could change to a different colored dress for the ceremony. 
I'm not one for etiquette by far, but one of the few things I have heard everywhere is that you should not wear a white dress to a wedding unless you're the bride. She became pretty upset and wanted to know what was wrong with her dress. I said that it would be inappropriate to wear a white or off-white dress unless you're the bride, and that's like wedding law or something, trying to be lighthearted about it. She rolled her eyes and said it was an outdated tradition about women and that when her friends got married, everyone wore white dresses and that it's not a big thing anymore. I told her that I don't know what the dress code is for this ceremony, but since it's not saying all white clothes, I still thought she should change to another color, but white or almost white because my colleague was getting married and we had no idea how she felt about it. My girlfriend became really upset and told me that I was trying to control what she was wearing and that I was being horrible to her, which honestly made me feel upset and hurt. I said something along the lines of, well, you shouldn't go to a wedding with me if I'm mistreating you. And then I told her to get the heck out of my car. She began to cry and wanted to apologize and give me a hug, but I just told her to get out, which she did. Edit. To clarify, we never left the driveway by her home. I did not drop her off in the middle of nowhere or anything like that. I drove off and she called and texted me a bunch. I answered, I don't want to talk right now, and then turned my phone off and attended the ceremony. The bride was the only one that was wearing white, so I feel as if my gut feeling was the right one. When I got home, my phone had blown up by texts from her and her best friend saying that I was being inconsiderate and controlling and should apologize for my behavior. I vented to a few friends, most of them agreeing with me, but some of them had said that it was a jerk thing of me to do to tell her that she could not wear her dress because it had nothing to do with me. I feel as if I was in the right since it was my colleague's wedding and it was better to be safe than sorry, but I'm also not sure if I was being a jerk about the situation. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Update, I never expected this thread to get many replies. I'm incredibly thankful for all of you that have reached out and commented and I really appreciate that you've taken the time to tell me. My girlfriend found out about the thread, don't know if she knew my handle or just found it, and we talked over the phone. She apologized and I apologized, and it was a pretty good talk. She asked if she could come over, and I said no, and that it would be best for us to go our separate ways. She got upset and asked why I wouldn't even try to work it out. I basically just said goodbye, and then she insulted me and hung up. I'm pretty sad about it. She really made me feel happy, but as many of you have commented, if this was our first disagreement, how would future disagreements look? So anyways, I think things worked out for the best for both of us. Again, thank you all, and I will keep trying to respond to all of you. But there are lots of messages, but I read through them all. Not the jerk. Your girlfriend should have known better. Unless you know the couple and it's a request, you don't wear white. She also overreacted, and you did the right thing by asking her to not go and to get out of your car. She overreacted because she 100% knew the rule. Yeah, the only way her attitude makes sense is if she's an attention seeker for not saying something else. Or if she was testing OP somehow, boundaries, or when inevitably someone in the wedding party asked her to leave to see how OP would react. I wonder if she's met and dislikes the coworker. This seems like a pretty deliberate snob. It doesn't matter if she's met her. To some people, anyone of the same gender within the realm of existence of your partner is automatically competition that needs to be overcome. I'm not sure if that's what was happening here, but there's no need for the two to have met for it to have been a snob. Am I the jerk if I press charges against my neighbor for breaking and entering? This is crazy, but just happened this past weekend. I, male 45, was alone and taking a nap for a couple hours upstairs and came down at about 4 p.m. I walked down and see a man walking out of my front door. I recognized him as my neighbor. We live in a townhouse complex and he lives right across from us. I confronted him. He apologized profusely and said he was drunk. Yeah, at 4 p.m. and made a mistake. I could smell it on his breath. Seemed believable, but I decided to make a police report anyway. They questioned him, but his story was believable, so that was the end. I go back inside, frazzled, but thought it was over. I check my phone and see auto messages about recent charges on my credit card from a convenience store near my house for several beers while I was sleeping. I call the police again and they were able to get a copy of the store security footage a couple days later. Surprise, surprise, it's him. The police arrest him this morning and he confessed to taking my wallet from my house, using my credit card, then returning it back to my house. He didn't even take the cash in the wallet. The whole thing is so bizarre, I would laugh about it. But then I think, what if my wife and kids were home? 
What could have happened? Then I just get angry all over again. And now I just got a letter from his wife saying how he is a drunk and getting help and begging me not to press charges. Part of me feels for her and wonders, am I the jerk? But the other part of me thinks I should not only press charges, but also sue them into oblivion, forcing them to move at the very least. So, am I the jerk if I press charges? Thanks for all the great opinions. I'm getting the same questions it seems, so here's some edits rather than trying to answer individually. Edit. The door was unlocked. We live in a gated community, so I just dropped my guard. The neighbors have money, so I have no idea why he did that. Maybe just to see if he could get away with it. The guy is being held in jail pending a court appearance this Friday. Likely will be released on bail, so no opportunity for him to apologize yet, if he does. I'm not angry about the money. I'm angry about the invasion of privacy and the fact that I won't have peace of mind in my own home from now on. I'm angry because what could have happened if my wife and kids were home. I'm angry for how much worse it could have been in general. I will be meeting with my wife tonight as she keeps begging for a meeting. Not the jerk. There should always be consequences when drinking leads to out of control behavior. Otherwise, you're enabling a selfish, destructive person to become even more selfish and destructive. This is such a good point. I would also like to point out that if he made it all the way into your house, found your wallet, stole credit cards, bought alcohol with them, and returned them, that this is likely not the first time he's done something like this. But it seems like it may be the first time that he's facing real consequences for it. The wife sounds like she's been enabling his behavior. Not the jerk. Press charges, not the jerk. Also, let anyone you're friends with around there know. If there's a landlord, they should know. The guy's a criminal, not a drunk. I know plenty of drunks that would never break into your house once, let alone twice, or steal your credit card. What's next? Waking up to him standing over you and your family? Also, what kind of locks and security do you have? Sounds like an upgrade is due. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you press charges or forgive your neighbor? Please let us know. Forgive thy neighbor? This ain't Bethlehem, bruh. We're going to have to throw them away. In the late 90s, I volunteered at a small private school. They had little money for extras like computers or computer teachers. I don't know much about computers, but I knew how to plug them in and I knew how to put one together if you gave me all the parts. So naturally, I got asked to be the director of the computer lab. It had two very old computers. And naturally, it was a volunteer job. I had very little money and a lot of time. They knew that I wanted a job. They told me that after I build it up, they would put a salary in the budget. I taught some classes the difference between the components, some file structure, some basic, some DOS, and how rebooting your computer usually solves whatever problems you have. The concept of drivers. The thing is, the director of the school hated fundraising, so my salary never got added to the budget, and the director often kept himself busy doing other things, useless things. One sunny morning, he finds me and tells me to wish him luck. If today goes right, we're going to have a huge computer lab. He comes back from his meeting with a huge smile. I did it. I convinced a bank to donate to us their old computers. Okay, great. Now I have to set up and maintain 50 new, for us, computers. I can't wait. The computers got delivered the next week. All terminals. These were bank computers. I had no idea how to get them running. They didn't even have hard drives or operating systems. The keyboard and mouse ports were different. They were not the standard PS2 at the time. I think they somehow connected to a server which did not get donated. Their monitors only did text, no graphics. They were useless to us. We needed something to run America Online, Encarta, maybe SimCity, you know, educational stuff. I had no idea how to get these to work. I tried asking the director, telling him that the 50 computers were useless. He got super annoyed. I'm sure they can be helpful in some way. They must be worth something. Figure it out. Because if you can't, we're going to have to throw them all away. He thought he was threatening me. He did not think I'd throw out 50 computers. After all, he worked hard to get them. I did not hesitate at all. My next class, I had screwdrivers for everyone. We disassembled everything. If it had a screw, we unscrewed it. The class figured out what each piece was, and then the class activity was to take the pieces to the dumpster. By the end of the day, there was nothing left. The next day, the director asked me where the computers were. Oh, you were right, they were very useful. The students took them apart, learned all about the different components, and then threw them out, just like you said we should. His face turned all sorts of colors, and he stormed out.
What I didn't tell him is that I saved the ram from the garbage. I mean, after all, it was in the garbage, right? And I sold them on the online classifieds. Remember Yahoo classifieds for $20 a piece? There were two in each computer, so I got $2,000. I guess they were useful after all. Am I the jerk for not celebrating my daughter's 18th birthday? Myself, 40 female, and my husband, 42 male, have a daughter who just turned 18 and is an only child. She has barely talked to us over the past few days and I wanted some perspective. Historically, we haven't always been there for her birthday because myself and my husband work long hours. We get her a cake, have a nice dinner at home on the closest day off to her birthday, but it's rare we spend the actual day with her. For her 18th birthday, daughter wanted to do something with her friends, and because me and my husband were working that night, we agreed. She proposed the idea of an escape room with 11 of her other friends, and it would be a competition, 6 versus 6, and finished with a meal after somewhere. We agreed and said we would pay for her meal. She and her friends would pay for the escape room themselves. However, a couple of her friends she wanted to come with her aren't great with money. They've borrowed money from my daughter before and have been a bit late paying her back, so we were hesitant in letting her book the escape room until we knew everyone had given her the money. My daughter was scared someone else would book the escape room. This was a week before her birthday and asked to book it. We said no and put our foot down, but my daughter went ahead and booked it with her friends anyway. S went behind our backs, so we told her that what she did was wrong and disrespectful and there wouldn't be any cake or a dinner this year and we stuck to our word. On our day off, we didn't do anything and she just sulked in her room. It's now been a few days after her birthday. We asked her if she had fun and she said everyone paid her and the night was fun and that was that. My husband doesn't think we did anything wrong, but I think I heard her crying in her room. She's still icy with us, so am I the jerk for not doing anything for her 18th birthday? Edit. We both work six days a week on 12-hour shifts for our business. Without us, it wouldn't run, so we can't book time off. Hence why we always spent the closest day off we have to our daughter's birthday with her. Edit 2. Our business is a takeaway we've had since she was born. It was either pursue university but have no means to live or find a new venture and have a means to live. My husband is the head chef and I work out front serving customers. We hold the business up and we've had to do so in order to have an income. Edit 3. I see we're clearly the jerks in this now. Thank you everyone, but messaging wishing bad things on my husband and I is a bit much. Our daughter has always been mature for her age and was quite understanding of us working so much, and now I begin to realize she might just be acting okay with it. I will talk to her about it and possibly look at getting her into therapy. Thank you all. So, you've essentially never made your daughter's birthday a priority. Then when she tried to do something nice for herself on an important milestone, you did your best to ruin it? You're the jerk, your husband is a jerk, and collectively, you should both be ashamed. OP, you're the jerk. Please don't be surprised when she goes no contact and disappears from your life. You may think that you had good intentions to neglect her, but all she'll remember is that you weren't there for her. Yep, all I remember is that my dad was never there for me. When he passed last year, I realized how unfair it was that I was still expected to be there for him anyway. I called BS and he didn't hear from me once, and I've now gone no contact with my remaining sisters. Got tipped over $200 for dealing with a jerk. Was bartending on a Saturday night. It was a typical busy Saturday, but nothing crazy. Had a couple sit down at the last two open seats and order something to drink while waiting for their table. They told me their wait was going to be 30 to 40 minutes. Husband got a small beer. Wife didn't want anything. Didn't want to look at the menu. About 20 minutes later, I gave them the check for the beer, just in case they get called to a table. I tried handing it to them, but nobody reached out to accept the check, so I just put it down. The husband looks at the receipt very briefly, but otherwise does not acknowledge that it's there, seemingly on purpose, but he did look at it. The host came to the table and said their table was ready, and the husband sent his wife to the table while he sat at the bar. As soon as I went out of his sight to make a drink for a server, this guy runs away to his table without paying his tab. About two minutes later, I went to the couple's table, it was close enough to easily get to, and politely reminded him about his bar tab. He said no, and he wants me to transfer it to the server. At this point, I knew he wasn't going to tip, and it wasn't worth fighting over one beer, so I just decided to say okay. Tried walking away, and he said I was being aggressive and wanted to talk to a manager. I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible, so I was like, alright, I'll send one out. 
I put the receipt on the table and he threw it at me and called me a jerk. I get back to the bar and the manager has a chat with me. The guests see but don't know why. Manager is kinda cool and we're both think first, react second types of people. Even though we didn't want to, the best thing to do was grudgingly comp the beer. Not worth risking a job for a $7 check. Some of the guests asked me what happened, pretty much explained everything that happened and one of the guests said that's ridiculous and gave me $100. Another guest at the other side of the bar was so upset, more so than even I was, that we had to comp the beer and gave me $100 too. A few other guests over tipped as well, multiple 20s and whatnot. So that's my story. Sometimes it's hard, but just keep cool even during annoying situations and more often than not, level heads prevail. Karen neighbor stole my mail. I got it back from her. I recently ordered a mini Keurig coffee maker because I'm moving and would like one for my apartment. I could not afford one when I first moved, but I have more money now, so it was something I really wanted to get. I came home from work yesterday and expected to see my Keurig, but it looked like it was not there. I looked at my security camera and found that someone who I don't recognize took my Keurig from my front porch. I filed a report with the postal service, but I haven't heard anything back yet. I have a friend in my neighborhood and she was hanging out with our neighbor and she noticed that my Keurig was at my neighbor's apartment. She asked my neighbor if she could deliver it to me and my neighbor said no because it was delivered to her so therefore it was fair game. This was a lie and I told my friend that it was not delivered to her, rather it was stolen. I was upset and I went over there to try to get it back but she tried to make me pay for it. I threatened to call the police because that's really the only line of defense I knew how to do and she ended up giving it back. Now however, she's not speaking to me and my family thinks that I overreacted. I think it was a bit extreme to threaten to call the police but mail theft is very serious and the Keurig was something that I was really looking forward to. I know I shouldn't care if I look bad but my family's reactions make me think that I was in the wrong. Am I the jerk? Edit. Thank you all for your nice comments. I honestly wasn't sure if I was overreacting, but I've realized that I was not. I will be filing a police report tomorrow, and I'm going to let people know that our neighbor is a thief. Hopefully it makes a difference, and even if not, I'm sure that doing this is the right thing. Also, I decided to open my Keurig, and I love it. I'm very glad I got it back. Not the jerk, but she's a terrible thief to steal and not get rid of the box with your name on it ASAP. OP. I totally agree. That's probably the first thing you get rid of if you're going to take something. The Keurig was still in the box on her kitchen counter. Not the jerk. She stole from you. That's the only point that matters. Why wouldn't you call the police? Especially since you have evidence that she took it. Don't know what your family's thinking saying that you overreacted. She stole and refused to give it back. Therefore, you'd be completely fair to call the police. OP. I just don't know if it's worth my time because I'm moving. I think it might still be a good idea though, only because she could do it again. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you call the police on your neighbor or not? Please let us know. Pro tip, never forget to throw away the box. Didn't go above and beyond? I'll delete everything that I've done. The original owner of the business I worked for was amazing. I'll call him Larry. He cared about every employee and realized how much we helped the company with our respective positions. He had even let me go negative on my sick time once when I was hospitalized for a week following a double pulmonary embolism with the agreement that I would work the time back, and I did. Just painting a picture of how wonderful Larry was as our boss. Larry finally retired after 45 years of running the business and sold it to his son, who I'll call Eric. Most people know how bad an idea that is, but Larry thought his son could handle it. He couldn't at first, but that's another story. Eric thought I wasn't doing enough during working hours, office job, dealing with inventory coming into the retail store, but what he failed to realize was that since I worked up there for six years and got familiar with the work, I was really efficient at the job, so much so that I had collected more responsibilities each year. Larry was one of the main people pushing for me to take on more each year with immediate raises every time something was added. Eric didn't have the same mentality. Eric fired me for being inactive for too long during the day and another reason which isn't important here. Also another story for another time. So I was really active for my last three days with deleting everything I had created for the company. It was all above and beyond work. So since I didn't ever go above and beyond, they didn't deserve to keep it. It was signs for products, pictures gathered for advertising, vendor contact information, a program I designed to keep organized and on time for invoices, 
and a manual I had typed up on how to do my job. They had an old version of my job instructions, but by that time, they were practically obsolete, especially with all my extra duties collected over the years. In the two years I've been gone, they've had at least eight people hired for my position who quit within a couple months. I keep getting updates every few months from one of my friends at the office, edit to address some questions and concerns. I did these things off the clock, on my own computer, except for some advertising images that were for past promotions and no longer valid. I never had to sign anything saying my intellectual property became theirs. Neither the job description nor handbook had anything about intellectual property either. I'm curious if Larry had any idea how his son was running the company, how he was treating you, or what his opinion was after you had been fired. OP, as far as I'm aware, dozens of employees emailed Larry about concerns about Eric's leadership, actually lack thereof, within six months of him taking over. Larry chewed him out, but the effect only lasted a few months. It happened at least three times in less than two years. Something finally registered and Eric was more present, but still not actually running the business. Am I the jerk for evicting a family so I can move in? My life is kind of in upheaval right now, so I really don't know if I'm the jerk in this situation or not. TA, because my brother is on Reddit. So, background. Six weeks ago, I, 27, female, found out that my husband, who's 30, has been cheating on me for the past five years with a few different women. I immediately moved myself and our kids, who are 7, 5, and 5, to my parents' house, where my brother, who's 22, also lives. Being only a three-bedroom, one-bathroom house, it's very cramped, but my parents insisted that I leave my husband. I've only worked part-time for extra cash since the twins started preschool two years ago and was a stay-at-home mom for five years before that. My husband owned our house and controlled our finances. I've realized in all of this that I own almost nothing, have almost no work experience, and only have a general studies associate degree. Had to cut college short because I got pregnant. Suffice to say that I'm freaking out about how I'm going to provide for my kids going forward because I do plan on divorcing. Which brings us to this post. On top of everything, my grandma passed two weeks ago. She was very private with her finances, and while we knew she and my late grandpa made money from renting houses, she told my mom a few years ago that she had sold all her rental properties. Come to find out that she kept two, and in her will left one to me and one to my brother, only grandkids. The one my brother inherited has been vacant for a bit, but the one I received is a four bedroom, one and a half bath, with a family of six that live there, a single mom and five kids. She's a friend of a friend, so I do know that her husband passed in 2020 from you know what. As much as I obviously miss my grandma, the house is an absolute godsend and I started crying when I found out about it. I told to my brother and his girlfriend, who's 20, how me and the kids can finally get our life back on track a bit. His girlfriend got really cold and asked if I was really going to evict a family when I could just live with my parents until I get on my feet, especially since my brother is now going to move into his inherited house and make more room and my brother agreed with her, saying it was selfish. My parents said it's my house and I can do what I want, but they see his point, and that the family living there could easily be in the same situation as me. It's been such an emotional few weeks, so I don't know if I'm being a selfish jerk or not. Edit. This has only been up for a little bit, but thank you so much for the advice and comments so far. It's been such a whirlwind that I forgot that I just need to stop and breathe sometimes. Thanks, anxiety. She's on a month-to-month -month lease for a little under market rent, I was so focused on the fact that I now own something other than my 15-year-old vehicle that I didn't even consider staying at my parents for a bit after my brother moves out. I recently started a more full-time position and my kids love their grandparents, so this makes the most sense while I tackle all the legal stuff that's coming my way. I'll talk to my parents tonight about this route, which would alleviate a ton of guilt I was already feeling about the possibility of eviction. Thanks for snapping me out of my own head for a bit. Not the jerk. Your brother and sister-in-law are guilt-tripping you. Also, the house your cheating husband thinks he owns is half yours. Make him sell or refinance and give you the money. Plus, go for alimony and child support. Do all of this while staying at your parents and collecting the rent from the home your grandma left you. Now you have cash, an income, and then buy another rental home and start building a rental empire. Good luck. Depending on state laws, OP's house may also be half his. OP needs the advice of a good lawyer pronto. Honestly, stay with the parents and charge the renters market price rent. You can use that money to assist you further. Moving into a house with zero income is going to see you lose that house and having to move back in with your parents anyway. 
Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you evict the family and move into the house or not? Please let us know. When you expect a five-star hotel paying for a two-star inn, one evening, working at the inn next to a main road in a popular tourist city of the Costa Bravo region of Spain. Like every morning, I was typing in the remaining customer data before submitting it to the authorities. We were fully booked, but one room hasn't shown up yet. 30 minutes before we close our check-in, a brand new Mercedes pulls up into our small parking lot. I can see from the inside emerges an older lady in her 60s. She enters the building without any baggage and heads towards me. I need to clarify that by that time, I'm the only worker in the whole building, and this conversation starts. Me. Welcome to the old lady. Where is the porter? Me. Unfortunately, we don't have that service in our inn. Old lady. What do you mean you don't have that service? All the hotels I was at before had it. Me. Well, we're a small roadside inn. We can't offer you any luxuries, but we do have one of the best kitchens in the city. Karen. Oh, I don't care about that. Who is going to carry my suitcase for me? Me. It will most probably have to be you, ma'am. Do you have a reservation? Trying to speed up the process before the system locks. Karen. Ugh, what kind of hotel doesn't have a porter? Yes, I do have a reservation. Me. Under which name? Old lady. Great. I can see that you paid it through our partner website. All I'll need is your passport or ID to finish the check-in process. She hands me her ID. I don't understand how you can have such a poor service. Me. We do what we can with what we have, ma'am. I return her ID with the key to her room. Here's your key. Room 102. First floor, second door on the right. Karen, disgusted. What is this? Pointing to the key I laid on the desk in front of her. Me. Confused. The key to your room. Old lady. Where is the card? Me. What card? The card to open my room. Oh no, we don't have electronic locks. You need to use this key to access your room. What? First you tell me that you don't have a porter, and now that I need to use a key for the room? What kind of hotel are you? Me. We're the two-star roadside inn you booked your stay at, ma'am. Karen, as she grabs her key and goes to her car for her suitcase. Unbelievable. I go back to type in all the remaining data. I can see she comes back with her small suitcase. Yes, she needed a porter for a small suitcase, the size one uses for an onboard baggage on flights, and marches towards the stairs. One hour later, as I'm in the middle of closing the restaurant, the front desk of the inn was the counter of the bar too, I can hear behind my back. Ahem, excuse me. Me. Yes, what can I help you with this time, ma'am? I can't find the hairdryer. Me. Um, unfortunately, I can't help you finding your hairdryer, ma'am. No. I mean, I can't find the hairdryer in the bathroom, the one you provide for me to use. Me. We don't provide individual hairdryers in our rooms. If you didn't bring your own, ma'am, I'm sorry to inform you that there's no hairdryer for you to use. What? How am I supposed to dry my hair? Every hotel provides a hairdryer. How do you people stay open if you don't know how to serve your customers? Me. Ma'am, if you're not happy with our service, you're more than welcome to bring your complaint to our manager tomorrow morning during your checkout. Oh, you can be sure I will. As she turns around and storms back to her room, I add, Have a great night, ma'am. This lady paid 30 euros for her room at a roadside inn and expected a five-star hotel experience. I found a baby. No, I really did. So it all started when I decided to do a property walk at 2 a.m. I was working audit that terrible night. I am a good soul, I think, and I go outside to check on cars to make sure nothing bad happened or anything like that. I notice a white sedan that had its engine on. Okay, no worries. Maybe some guest that is coming right back. I continue my little walk. I go to the hotel next door, dual property, and chat with the auditor over there. I head back to my hotel and notice the white sedan is still running. I shine my flashlight in the vehicle. I stand there, stone cold, as the head twitches in the back seat. Twitch again. Twitch. Now my heart is racing. Who the heck would have Annabella in the back seat? Wait, no. It's not a cursed doll. The thing is breathing. I yank out my phone and I call 911 immediately. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, um, there's a baby in a car and I'm not sure where the parents are. Is the car on? Yes. Did you try to break into the vehicle? No, not yet. Okay, just stand near it and I'll send medics. What's your address? Sure, here's the address. 
Great. Like I said, just stand near the vehicle, and emergency units have already been dispatched and are currently en route. Thank you, ma'am. I hang up. By this time, my hands are sweaty. I need to go to the bathroom. No, no, Ryan. You have to stand here and watch. I pace back and forth in front of the sedan as I hear the sirens approaching. Thank goodness they're close. A police car races up to me, followed by an ambulance, then a fire truck. As the police officer breaks into the car, more and more police show up. Okay, so now we have seven cop cars, two ambulances, three fire trucks, for one baby? Sure, I don't make the rules. After the baby is safely retrieved from the vehicle, we try to go on our security tapes, but thanks to our wonderful management company, they barely work. Also, 480p. Fast forward a few weeks. An officer that I recognize walks into the lobby of the hotel. She catches me up to speed on the case. So apparently, they found the baby daddy next door to our hotel with a lady. How lovely. And to make things worse, or better, the mom didn't know the baby daddy took the baby 40 minutes away to a hotel. We love good families. End of story. Good day. I hope that guy loses his parental rights. Am I the jerk for getting mad when my soon-to-be husband wants to change our honeymoon to family vacation? My boyfriend, who's 33, and I, who am 22, will get married in four months. We're planning our wedding ourselves and discussed everything, including our honeymoon. At first, a few months ago, he said he wants to change our honeymoon to a family vacation so his parents and my mom can get along and know each other more. I agreed, so we're researching where to go and for how long. But a few weeks after that, he said he didn't want to bring his family because his relationship with them is kind of rough. I agreed again and started researching again. Honeymoon plans for just the two of us. Everything went fine until a few days ago I was shopping with my soon-to-be mother-in-law and on the ride home my boyfriend asked her if she wants to join in our honeymoon. I was shocked and mad but I stay silent. After we dropped her off, I asked him what if my mom doesn't want to go with us. My mom really said she didn't want to. He said it's okay and we can just go with his family. It really bothered me, but because we have a plan to meet his friend afterwards, I just kept it to myself not to ruin the mood. After I went home, I texted him and said that I'm mad about the sudden change. I rant a bit, as usual, every time I'm angry. Then he gets mad as well because he thinks I'm making a big deal of something that's not important. In the end, we both get mad and give each other the silent treatment until now. I'm not mad because he changed the plan, I'm mad because he didn't talk to me first before asking his mom. I still think I have the right to get mad, but also I feel guilty for making a fuss about something small. So, am I the jerk? Update. Hi everyone. I don't expect this to blow up and I have so many comments. Thank you for your concern and advice, I appreciate it so much. And I'm sorry I can't read and reply to everyone. For everyone who's asking, I met my boyfriend when I was already 20. So no, I'm not being mistreated, but thank you for your concern. For everyone who reminded me what he's doing is a red flag, yes, I know it sounds so bad, but I think everyone on relationships knows that there's lots of crap that if you tell everyone just from your perspective, it will sound really bad. It's just one of many things on our relationship, I guess. He's not perfect, and so am I. I also know my relationship isn't perfect nor ideal, but we love each other and we will keep working on from there. Now I know I'm not the jerk for getting mad, so I'll talk to him again with more confidence and I hope we can make up and do better. Once again, thank you for all the kind and not so kind advice. Wishing you all a really nice day. Not the jerk, but do not marry this man. You're too young and the age gap is too big. Worse than that though, he does not respect you and would happily put his family's desires above yours, even in the content of a wedding, which should be entirely about the two of you. If he will do this now, what else might he deprioritize you in? Think about this carefully. Not the jerk. I would be more mad about him constantly changing the plan and not consulting you. It's just so annoying, and if I'm being honest, a bit of a red flag. He's forcing you into situations that you don't want to be in, taking advantage of the fact that you can't make a scene in public. Well, if you don't like it, you can quit. Okay, sure. The state I live in had just done away with their mask rule about a month or so prior. I was working in a small cafe, having quit my full-time job in January of 2021 in order to limit my exposure to getting sick. The owner of this cafe didn't actually care about it. She was an empty nester stay-at-home mom with a rich husband who decided she wanted to put small business owner in her Facebook bio. So us five baristas were the ones actually running the cafe. I was naively sucking up and the hopes that I could put general manager as my job title on my resume 
So in future job interviews, they wouldn't awkwardly ask why I went from a full-time manager in charge of ordering supplies to a part-time barista in a dinky tourist cafe. I was putting in a lot of work for $9 an hour. I was purchasing supplies and doing inventory on my own dime and my own time and then submitting receipts for reimbursement. I was categorized as part-time but pulling full-time hours and could regularly be found on my days off talking with my coworkers and likely making a few drinks when it was more convenient for me to be doing the work. And the craziest part is I wasn't unique in the work I was putting into this place. None of us were working there for the money because the money was crap. This was a blank slate of a cafe that we were given the freedom to turn into whatever we wanted and we were all passionate about making it the space we wanted it to be. My boss got to say she was a small business owner and put an apron on to pose for Instagram selfies once a month when she actually worked there and we got to develop a great atmosphere with cool customers and a great staff. But back to lockdown, that's where this story really begins. Three of our five baristas got sick all at the same time and us being homebodies, we would have only gotten it from the cafe. The five of us who actually worked there jumped on a text group chat that included my boss to discuss what likely happened and what we wanted to do going forward. All of us wore masks, but since our county's health department hadn't made it mandatory yet, we hadn't been throwing too much of a fuss when people came in without them. We just rolled our eyes and made their drinks. In the text group chat, the five of us agreed that under these circumstances, we should impose the mask rule on our own, regardless of the county stance, but the owner was adamantly against it. She had every reason under the sun why she wouldn't allow us to impose our own rule. She said since the county didn't have one, we shouldn't either. We totes shouldn't have gotten sick from the cafe because one of the three who caught it had only worked two days the week the others did, etc. I was really frustrated by this because it feels like it's easy for someone to make decisions about other people's health when they don't actually spend any time whatsoever in that environment. Plus, her motivations were perfectly transparent. She had an obsession with our reviews on Google. And in the state of Utah, if a business requires people to wear them, the business suddenly gets quite a few one-star reviews. I would have preferred to talk to her in person, but since my boss never spent any time in the cafe, I instead sent her a text outside of the group chat expressing my concerns. I felt I was very professional and assertive saying, Hi owner, I would really like to encourage you to rethink your stance on this within the store, at least for the potential duration that any of us might be sick, both for our safety and for the safety of our customers and she responded with the absolute most passive-aggressive text I think I've ever seen. I'll go ahead and type out a few spicy portions of the long text she sent in reply. Owner, if another person gets sick, I will be closing the cafe without knowing for how long. If you do not feel comfortable at the cafe or are worried about your health, I understand if you do not want to continue to work at the cafe. As of now, it is still a choice for guests to wear them. Basically, forget you. If you don't like it, you can quit. I was annoyed. I didn't send anything in response. Instead, I updated my resume on my phone and started to apply to other jobs. I got a few interviews and very quickly landed a job. This was at the height of signs and windows saying, please work for us. And right before I was going to give my boss two weeks notice, for the sake of my coworkers, not for her, the county imposed a new rule and she texted the group chat something like, guests are required to wear them now, yay. As if that was the only thing keeping us from enforcing it. So that's when I officially quit. I think it really caught her off guard that I called her bluff like that, and as soon as I walked out the door for the last time as an employee, she was scrambling to pull things back together since my coworkers were not about to make things easy and pick up the work I dropped for her. She was so disgruntled by my quitting that she went so far as to change all the locks on the store and change all of the computer passwords as if I was going to sneak in in the middle of the night and steal from her. She really showed her true colors. Two of my former coworkers are currently looking for other jobs and it sounds like my former boss has really started to lose it now that she has to do work for the cafe. It's not fun to work there anymore, and getting my boss up to speed on how to work inside the cafe she owns is like teaching a high schooler whose mom made them get a summer job. Am I the jerk for not letting my friend's kids have any of the treats in my house? I'll try to make this short and sweet. I have four kids who are ages 4, 6, 8, and 10. Each kid has their own little snack box in the pantry. It's basically a cardboard box with their name on it that they've decorated how they like. Whenever we buy snacks of any kind, aside from healthy things like nuts or fruits or veggies, etc., we'll put an equal amount in each of the kids' snack box. Otherwise, the box would be emptied in a few days and because they would all come to eat some and one kid would end up eating much more than another or someone just wouldn't get any. 
We figured this way they all get equal amounts and can learn how to regulate on their own how much they eat and how long it lasts. It has led to some interesting trades between them, trading snacks for snacks or chores for snacks, etc. Thankfully, we haven't had much trouble with them stealing from each other. So we have a few good friends who come over a lot. Between them, they have three kids that come over with them and play with our kids, ages 3, 8, and 12. Last week they came over and the 3-year-old wanted a snack cake that was in my 8-year-old snack box. Every one of my other kids have already eaten their cakes and my 8-year-old had two left. They each started with three. The 3-year-old asked for one and my 8-year-old said no. She didn't want to share because they were her favorite and she was saving them for later. 3-year-old threw a tantrum and friend's spouse was upset I wouldn't make my kid share. I said they were her snacks and she didn't have to share if she didn't want to. Friend's spouse said that it wasn't fair I had snack cakes where a toddler could see them and tell her that she couldn't have one and that my snack box system is going to cause my kids to have a bad relationship with food or cause hoarding problems or something like that in the future. That they need to learn to share. I said they do know how to share. I just don't make them share food and that the three-year-old can have anything else in the house, just nothing from their snack boxes. She said that all the good stuff was in the snack boxes and if I was going to do this, I should leave some out for when the other kids come over so they can have some too. Am I the jerk for not making my kids share her snacks even if it really upset my friend's kid? Not the jerk. I cannot fathom taking my kids to a friend's house and arguing like this, let alone suggesting that their kids are going to have a bad relationship with food or cause hoarding just because my kid didn't get a little Debbie snack and threw a tantrum. Next time they pull this, you need to teach your kids how to share, point out that they need to teach their kids the meaning of no. 100% agree with this, not the jerk. These parents are being completely unreasonable. I can't believe grown adults are behaving this way. Also, they have absolutely no right to be telling you that your parenting practices are going to lead to them having a bad relationship with food, etc. I wish my mom would have done something like that for me because it may have helped me not to have a bad relationship with food. You're the jerk. Maybe it's a regional or a cultural thing. As a Southern American, I cannot imagine inviting someone to my home and making any food off limits. That just boggles my mind that someone is this inhospitable. Right? My mind is so boggled too. When I went to friends' houses, they always fed and gave me snacks and vice versa. This comment section is weird. I feel like, over the past few years, people have taken you don't owe anyone anything a bit too far. Whether it's interpersonal relationships or in stuff like this, it's just seeped way too deep into people's decision making in my opinion. Like sure, you don't, but you should also be ready for the consequences, such as your friends thinking you're kind of a jerky friend. We now conflate boundaries with selfishness and self-centeredness. Hint, you can be gracious and generous and have boundaries, really. Yes, I think it's important we have terms like boundaries, gaslighting, mistreatment, self-care, etc. because those concepts are useful, but people can really run wild with them. Like the other day when people were arguing it was fine for a man to go no contact with his kid, in other words, abandon her, because she had been mistreating him between the ages of 11 and 14, aka she had learned he had cheated on her mom and was being upset about it. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her friend? Please let us know. Maybe we need some extra snacks for when friends come over. Am I the jerk for ordering delivery food when I only live a few blocks away from the restaurant? There's a local burger joint that my family and I love. It's about 10 blocks away from our house and they do both delivery and pickup. I'm a full-time student and stay-at-home mom to a toddler who's one and a half while my husband works full-time. I had a big exam and a couple of lab practicals due today and was too tired to cook dinner so I decided to order a couple burgers and fries from the local joint. It was already dark out, really cold, and I didn't feel like trying to wrangle my kid into the snowsuit or the stroller to walk over there as we don't have a car. So I ordered delivery on their website for an additional fee. This wasn't a delivery service like DoorDash or Uber Eats. The restaurant uses its own online platform and hires its own drivers to deliver food. I paid online and left a 20% tip. About 30 minutes later, I get a notification the delivery driver was at my building, so I went downstairs to pick up my food. When I got to the door, the delivery person was very rude and told me that next time I should get off my butt and go pick up my own darn food and that she doesn't get paid enough to deliver food less than a mile. I just grabbed my food and didn't say a word to her and headed back to the elevator. I heard a pound on the locked door as I walked away and turned around to see she'd hit the door with some snow and was giving me a mean gesture. 
I went upstairs kind of frazzled and ended up calling the restaurant to let them know what happened and to please reimburse me for my tip. The manager I talked to was horrified and apologized and ended up returning my tip. He also offered a 20% off coupon for a future visit. We love this burger shop, so this poor experience isn't going to stop us from eating their food. I just am not going to get delivery from them again. Am I the jerk for ordering delivery from a restaurant a few blocks away? Is this some kind of unwritten rule of delivery that I didn't know about? Not the jerk. Like, that's a super easy and close delivery. And if anything, it being shorter makes it more lucrative on a tip time ratio. I don't think the delivery driver was a high IQ individual. Seriously, that driver has no idea what OP's situation is either. She could be home alone and stuck with her three kids, unable to just go pick up her food easily. Definitely not the brightest person. Am I the jerk for not wanting to pay for my stepchildren's private school? I, 30 female, have two stepkiddos, both girls who are 9 and 11. They are from my husband's, 51 male, previous marriage. I've been in their lives for over 5 years and we are a happy unit. Husband shares custody 50-50 with his ex-wife who I'll call Candy. When husband and Candy got a divorce, they agreed to keep the girls in a private Catholic school they had been attending since pre-K. Last year, Candy moved to a town 30 minutes away and insisted the girls go to a school closer to her home. We live in a major city, so traffic and construction add to this time depending on time of the day. Husband and I agreed, but insisted we discuss public school options as both kids are growing tired of Catholic school and have expressed repeated interest in public school. Candy brought up the divorce decree and demanded they go to the Catholic school close to her new house and offered to pay full tuition, over $12,000. We tried to tell Candy that we needed to agree on what's best for the girls, and since her new area has highly rated public schools, we will concede the location but insist on a public school or even staying at their old school for another year. She enrolled them in the new Catholic school anyway. Today, the school is asking parents for next year's tuition. Candy has asked us to pay for half. I said, how about none of us pay tuition and the girls go to public school like we discussed last year? Not maliciously or in front of the kids. Husband wants to pay up just to keep the peace, but I'm not interested in paying tuition for a school I don't like and the girls don't like. Am I the jerk? Stay-at-home partner wants me to help with the baby, but I work 100 hours a week. I know the title sounds bad, but I'm finding myself in a very difficult situation and I'm genuinely not sure if I'm in the wrong here. I, 27 male, am a surgical resident. My partner, 27 female, was a teacher but is currently a stay-at-home mother to our newborn child. We met in college and have been together for just over 7 years now. Last year she took a pregnancy test and found out that she was pregnant. We were both happy but also concerned about taking care of a child. My main concern when we found out was that I could not help out with the kid because I work between 80 to 100 hours a week. However, we both love each other and did want a family. So in the end, we decided to keep it and then she would take time off of work while I was completing my residency and take care of the baby. I would complete my residency and then, after having somewhat more humane hours, I would obviously split child caring duties equally with her so that she can also return to work. It's been three months since our kid was born now and things have been rough to say the least. I'm still working nearly 100 hours a week and I'm constantly at the brink of exhaustion. If anything, my workload has increased since then, as I'm now learning how to perform larger operations. My sleep is almost non-existent, and I'm constantly under intense pressure due to my work environment. Things have obviously been rough for her too. The pregnancy and delivery were without complication, but it goes without saying that it was still hugely taxing on her mentally and physically. Recently, my partner has been asking me to take care of our kid when I get home. Initially, I helped her without hesitation, feeling like it was within my capacity and wanting to support her. But in the past few weeks, she's been asking more and more of me, and a few days ago, she demanded I take care of our kid immediately as I walked into the door. I hadn't even had time to take off my shoes yet, and when I said, just give me a second, she told me to hurry up. I later learned that she had an incredibly rough day and was just at capacity, but in the moment, I was so caught off guard I yelled back at her to back off. I was too exhausted to deal with it then, so I locked myself in the bathroom to take a long shower and calm down. We later talked about what had happened and apologized to each other, but during it, she essentially told me that she felt like I wasn't doing enough to take care of the kid and that it was our responsibility equally. 
I told her that I felt like I was already doing more than we agreed on and that I can literally not do any more than what I am currently doing. After talking and arguing about this for about two hours, we still couldn't come to an agreement and decided to leave the topic for now. So, am I the jerk for not wanting to take on a larger parenting role during residency? Friends I've talked to seem split on the matter. Not the jerk. This is a case of two people drowning and arguing over who has their head up out of the water a few inches more than the other. You have a newborn, you're working 100 hours a week, and a wife who is most likely so overwhelmed she can't see straight. Both of you are sleep deprived and not in your right mind. What you need is help. I don't care who said they would do what before the baby came. It's here now and it's not what either of you expected. It's time to start from scratch and use your limited energy to find solutions to give you both reprieve. This, this right here. No one in this situation is the jerk. They're just both exhausted, doing very taxing and demanding jobs and tasks and need help. I know OP said they can't afford help right now, but they both need to figure out something before this tears them apart. Call for reinforcements. Get a cleaning lady or a person once a week to deal with the household chores, vacuuming, dusting, doing some laundry, ironing, scrubbing bathrooms, well worth the money. Call in grandma or family and friends if possible to watch the baby while wife can just have a nap and maybe even have someone to visit with. Or find a responsible teenager who has experience with babies who can come over a few hours a week and watch the baby or watch TV while wife catches a nap. If childcare options are really good, try to allow your wife to escape child-free for a few hours to the gym, yoga, dance, or whatever that may allow her a bit of child-free physical activity that can help reset her mental and physical health. Being home with a baby is tough. Try to find a few hours each week for you as a couple or family, even if it's just a meet for lunch, if possible. Arrange for groceries to be bought online and delivered. Walmart Click and Collect can be picked up by an Uber or a taxi and delivered to the door. Some grocery stores deliver. Find out what system works. Encourage your wife to find other moms in the same position. Having a support system with other parents or babies allows her to actually visit someone who doesn't mind if baby tags along and cries the whole time. Plus, as the kids get older, it allows them to have other kids in their lives. And offer your wife the opportunity to put baby in childcare and go back to work. Not every person is cut out to be at home with their kids 24-7. Doesn't mean she's a bad parent, but she re-energizes by outside of home interaction. Not the jerk. You're both in a hard situation, but you can get through it. Don't be afraid to call for reinforcements. Also, check with the hospital you're doing a residency at. Do they have a childcare program that you could use? Even part-time? Or can they recommend one? Just start brainstorming ideas with your wife on how to make this work. Write down good ideas and some absolutely silly ones too. It actually will help even if you are met with glares. Then after you have tons of ideas, serious and ridiculous, you go through the ideas together and start crossing some off to narrow down the list. Don't narrow it down too much. You want plans A through E because sometimes plans change. And try to agree to help your wife figure out what she needs at this point to be happy and how you both can make it work. Good luck, OP. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Husband expects me to pay for him and his family's meals. Title sounds bad, I know, but I'll let you decide who's in the wrong. To begin, my husband and I don't share finances. It's been like this for the three years of our marriage, and so far we've been doing well. Though he had sometimes tried to get me to pay for him, but I do it only when I want to do a nice thing for him. Say, invite him to a restaurant. This past week, he got a bonus at work. He was overjoyed. He informed his entire family and planned for them to go out and celebrate with us. He picked the restaurant, meals, drinks, etc. I naturally thought he was going to pay for all of that since it's his happy celebration. But it turns out I was wrong because when it was time to pay the bill, he told me to take care of it. I said, why? It's his celebration, not mine. But he insisted I pay and he'll explain later. I refused and demanded an explanation. He said that while yes, he is the one who got the bonus, he assumed I'd want to celebrate that and offer to cover the bill. When I talked about how ridiculous it was of him to assume I'd pay for not just his, but his family's meals, he said that I should be happy for him instead of being visibly bitter. He then said he's yet to receive his bonus and begged that I take care of the bill now and that he might consider paying me back later. I refused and only paid for what I consumed. Him and his family started talking about how inappropriate I was acting. I took my purse and went home afterwards because there was so much commotion when they started arguing who's going to cover the bill. 
His mom spam called me for hours and he went off on me at home saying I spoiled his celebration and joy because I'm feeling bitter, especially considering I had enough money to cover the bill right then and there. I said this wasn't my obligation and he was the one who came up with a celebration idea. He argued that if the roles were reversed and I got a bonus, he'd celebrate me and my achievements and pay for the darn meal after taking me and my family out. I casually said, well, that's just you, not me. He got even more upset and said that he had had it with my juvenile antics and that he won't ever forget the scene I made at the restaurant in front of his family. Been upset with me for days now. Update. Wow, too many responses here, you guys, and I'm seeing a variety of judgments. Just so you know, my husband just got home and I'm going to show him these responses right now. I'll update with his opinion soon. Thanks. Update. We just got into an argument. I showed him what I posted and he lost it on me. I accept my judgment, but he won't. He said, and I quote, These people have no idea. And said that I should have mentioned that I make more money than him. Not that much, and I don't think it justifies it. And that he had paid the bill for me in the past when I forgot my wallet. But I did pay him back, so... He's pretty upset right now. He kept laughing sarcastically when reading some of the comments. He just walked out of the kitchen to take a phone call and said he'll be back. I'm still here with the dog waiting to see how this goes. I'll update if there's any new info. Not the jerk. It's common knowledge that you do not invite people to dinner and then expect them to pay for everyone else. You don't trap your spouse in awkward situations like that either. He said the celebration was for his bonus. He invited everyone out to eat. Both of these, especially combined, imply that he's going to pay. He purposely set you up and then he got his family in on it. He's using you to the point where I would argue that this is financial mistreatment, especially since he's done things like this before. I would take a careful look at this relationship and see if it's going to work. I would insist on couples counseling if I were you. Counseling, at the very least. Maybe I'm weird, but when I got a bonus, I paid for a celebratory dinner with friends. Like the husband, I invited people, but I paid because I was the one with the extra money after all. Not everyone gets a bonus, so it was a way to share my good fortune. This dude seems somewhat like a jerk. Is he trying to make her look bad in front of his family or something? Not the jerk. You guys have separate finances. He didn't ask you beforehand. This was wildly tacky and presumptuous of him. The maybe I'll pay you back really sealed it for me. What a tool. OP. This is exactly how I felt then. He might see it as pettiness or jealousy, but I swear it's not like that at all. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. So hubby said we have no idea, huh? Well, he's right. I don't have any idea how someone can be as entitled as he is. Bill by the hour? Then I want the full hour. Years ago, I worked in the head office of a national corporation. Although we were all salaried employees, everyone had to keep a weekly timesheet. We had to account for everything we worked on so our department could build the appropriate team or group for our time. This was a company-wide requirement, so it wasn't just a case of our leaders micromanaging. The least time you could log in was a 15-minute increment. Every minute of every day couldn't be billed to other departments, so we had a code that was billed to our own team's budget. This was used for general tasks, not specifically attached to any ongoing projects, like checking emails, status meeting your manager, training and development, and even filling in the timesheet. Management emphasized that we should use our team code as little as possible. I later learned that the less time billed to our team's code meant a bigger pool of bonus money for our whole team at the end of the year. One of the internal services that regularly billed our team's code was IT. Anytime we needed computer support, they'd send an agent who would troubleshoot and fix the problem. When the work was done, they'd get us to sign a work order so they could bill our team. No big deal. About a year after I joined the company, the IT department changed their billing protocols. While every other group in our company would bill you in 15-minute increments, IT decided that they'd bill in one-hour increments. No idea how they sold that to the VPs, but no one objected. So if IT took only 15 minutes to solve my issue, they'd still bill my team's code for one hour. It didn't take long for my bosses to notice that our team's code was being billed a lot more than it had in the previous months, but no one connected the dots and tied it to the new IT billing practices. Cue malicious compliance. Here's how my next encounter with the on-site IT agent went. IT, all done, please sign the invoice. Me, this invoice is for one hour's work. You were only here for 15 minutes. IT, new policy, just sign it. Me, I'm sorry, I can't do that. 
IT. I don't have time to argue. We're really busy and I have to move on to the next ticket ASAP. Tell you what, I won't bill you for this visit, but next time you'll have to sign regardless of how quickly we can solve your problem. This happened a few more times and I continued to object to any bill that didn't reflect the actual time spent on my issues. They kept agreeing to give me a free pass this time. After about the fourth or fifth time, the IT agent finally stood his ground. IT. You have to sign this invoice. Me. I'll gladly sign it in 45 minutes once you've been here for a full hour. Feel free to pull up a chair and sit down. He was clearly frustrated, but he decided to call my bluff. He sat down. A minute later, he pulled out his laptop and started working on something else. Me. What are you doing? IT. Getting caught up on a few things while I wait out the hour. Me. Oh no, this is my time. You're not allowed to work on anything else for anyone else. IT. What do you expect me to do? Just sit here and do nothing? Me. Yes, if you want me to sign that invoice, then you will sit there and do nothing until the hour is up. This guy was stubborn, so he did indeed sit there for the rest of the hour. I signed the invoice and he went on his way. I shared this story with my colleagues and they all decided to do the same thing the next time they needed IT support. This went on for about one week, then IT changed their tune. They no longer asked anyone on my team to sign off on any invoices unless the job actually took one hour or longer. It turned out that they were generating so many billable hours doing this to every team across the company that dealing with our malicious compliance wasn't worth it. They chose to service our team for free rather than give up those 45 minutes they could bill to two or three other departments at one hour each. That year, our team saw nice bonuses when we had a massive surplus of funds in the team's budget. I heard the IT team made out like bandits on their bonuses, while many other teams saw little to nothing. The next year, the whole internal billing system was overhauled. We didn't have to account for our time anymore, and IT stopped issuing anyone invoices. All billing was managed at a more senior level. Crazy liar dad finds out where I live and attempts to give my apartment to his random friends without my knowledge. Context. I'm 25, female. My parents are so crazy to the point where me and the majority of my family had to cut them off. For me personally, my dad completely, and my mom calls on occasion. My mom also tries to overstep, such as inviting him to family events he's specifically not invited to. The reason is, he tries to steer every conversation and attempts to talk about himself. People usually don't care or want to hear them. He argues with people, threatens them, and she purposefully does this, knowing that they'll cause an argument and she gets joy out of it. So needless to say, sane people don't want these issues in their lives. My dad is delusional and narcissistic to the point where he thinks he's famous and claims everyone runs up to him for pictures and says he's famous and someone he knows is making a movie about him. Lies about it, obviously, because no one has ever seen this and it's a running joke. People laugh at him. He thinks it's with him and not at him. He's lost all of his friends due to his poor behavior, such as arguments, belittling, non-stop phone calls, but on to the story of his lies and delusions. I have an apartment and I didn't give him my address because we aren't on speaking terms and he threatened me because I wouldn't give him my personal info so he could take out loans in my name. Like, that's an obvious no. Also, I didn't grow up with him, so I barely know him. He has apparently told people he has an apartment that he lets his daughter, me, live in. This is what I've been told. He likes to pretend to be a big shot, so I guess he told some people who needed a place to live they could come stay at my apartment. He got my address from a family member. I assume my mom due to the fact that no one I know speaks to him. One day I get a call from my apartment building manager saying there are some people at the gate saying they're here to move into my unit. I was just as confused as she seemed, as well as the people he sent to live at my place. He somehow thinks it's his place. Mind you, it's my place. I pay the bills, and I didn't even know he knew my address. So I go out and meet these said guests, as there was much confusion. These three people, three random sketchy older guys, side note, I would at most let a friend stay a few nights if needed, not random strangers. I ask what's going on. My building manager stayed because she wanted to know what was going on and wanted to help sort it out, and she would also know who's moving in and out because she's in charge of leasing and the building isn't that big. We all know each other. The three men proceed to tell me that they're moving into my place and they're here for the keys. You're his daughter, right? He said you'd be out by the time we got here and keys would be at the front desk. We all looked and I said, do you see a front desk? I asked to see what was the address. 
We thought maybe wrong address. Nope, my address. So the guy said, Your dad said he kicked you out because he said you're freeloading and he had you leave the keys at the non-existent front desk. By this time, all five of us were confused, but they had my address. I said he didn't even have my address, so I don't know how he got it. By this time, they're all trying to call him to sort it out. He's not answering at the moment. So I explained to them, I don't know how you or he got my address. I haven't spoken to him in about a year, and I don't know how I'm freeloading or what he's told you, but this is my place, and I don't know what's going on. Y'all need to figure it out with him, but I have no place for you. Sorry. They try to get me to call him. I said no, and calling won't change anything. And this isn't my problem, so I can't help you. By the way, they didn't seem threatening. It was just random and weird for everyone. I hear one guy on the phone talking to my dad. I hear him tell him that I'm lying, etc. Ask her to show you the lease. At this point, one of the guys and my building manager are all looking like this is odd, and he looks embarrassed. My manager stepped in at this time, luckily. She told the man, you all must have the wrong place. She's on the lease, and she's the only one on the lease. You will all have to leave and sort it out. I can say, despite them looking sketchy initially, they were as calm as could be in their odd situation, because in all honesty, the only fault they had was believing my dad. They thought they were moving into an apartment for free. If I was in that situation, I wouldn't be happy either. After apologizing and before leaving, I heard one of them saying, I knew something was up. He's always lying. I asked, what did he tell you? One of the men said he had told him that he had had a spot for him to move in, all furnished and paid up to the rest of the year. I kicked my daughter out because she's freeloading, but claimed that he couldn't get out of the lease. I said something like, well, like your friend said, he's a liar. I don't know how, why, and what made him do this. I never gave him my address. He isn't on the lease. I don't even talk to him. So, I'm sorry, but I hope it works out. I don't know what my dad thought would happen, but like I said, he's delusional. He probably assumed all he was saying was true. Or maybe he assumed there was a front desk, and whoever was at the front desk would just magically let three random people in, and I'd have no say. It's all so crazy that I can't even attempt to understand. There is no use. Also, I told my manager thanks, and if anyone comes when I'm not home, please give me a call or call 911. If I have a guest coming, I'll be home to greet them. Happy Guest and Lessons on Making Assumptions A while back, before lockdown. One day, I'm at the front desk, and two late 20-something guys walk in, looking like they're sponsored by a surf company and just getting in from a demo. Definitely not our typical 30th anniversary type guests. I greet them and they ask if there's anything available. We chat a bit and I show them a room because I had time and I liked their vibe. During the tour, one of the guys tells me they're on a road trip up the East Coast. No real agenda. Just a bucket list trip for two best friends and the other guy lets me know he just lost his dad. Basically, they were working through some stuff while road tripping. We get back to the desk. I get ready for the, so what can you do for us? Question that most walk-ins try. I give them the price and they both pause and blink at me. We're not cheap, but that's pretty obvious when you get on site. But at this point, most walk-ins tend to walk out. Guy one looks at guy two. So this one, you or me? Guy two, I got this one. You got dinner last night. Guy one, yeah, but you got the last, this goes back and forth a minute but I always hate these conversations and offer to split it if needed. They both pause and smile at me. Oh no, I've insulted them. Guy two, can you make us dinner reservations for eight? And can I see a wine list? Me, yes sir, how 7.30 p.m.? Guy one, perfect. Do we get breakfast? Me, with the room? Yes, we include afternoon also. Are you AAA members? I can do a small discount if yes. They both look up like I was speaking Greek. Guy one, tea for real? Me, uh, yeah, it started a few minutes ago and it goes to guy two. Can I get the key? Me, I still need a credit card and ID. Guy two, oh yeah, one sec. Guy one, oh snap, as he proceeds to drop an American Express black card on the desk victoriously. I give them the sad 5% AAA discount anyway because I had already put it in the system. I proceed to check them in and they leave. About 30 minutes later, they come up for tea. They are clearly both on something, eyes are saucers, both grinning ear to ear and moving at the pace of someone who is in an alternate timeline. They say hi and proceed to tell me how lovely the water is right now. It's New England in November, it is not lovely. 
They sit for tea and giggle like kids through the whole thing. Pinkies up was the tea motto that day. They even had other guests going along with them. They go on about the beauty everywhere and that people need to appreciate it more. On the way out, they thank me again for the tea and I remind them it's included. Who knew this would be the key amenity for these two? I'm just thankful their substance of choice made them happy and not into jerks. They are clearly getting the most out of the property they can. 7 p.m. rolls around and dinner is humming along. I get a call from their room and they asked if we had a few bottles in inventory. I check with F and B to confirm and they ask to have them ready for their 7.30. We arrange it, chilled and decanted as needed with one to be left corked till requested. They come to dinner and proceed to drop the most I've ever seen for a party of two in our restaurant. Apparently, these were just the starter bottles and they did some damage to our liquor list too. On the way out, they stop by for a chat, ask about checkout, and say I need to talk to their server before I leave, which seemed odd, so I asked if everything went okay at dinner. They both reply with an oddly cold, yes, thank you. Okay, what happened? At the end of the shift, I go talk to their server. She proceeds to fill me in on the details about them, their travels, etc. Apparently, she got the full life story and an invite to California, along with the 20% tip, wine included. Okay, but why did they say to come see you? Server. Because they left you this, as she produces a gift bag from the pair. It contained a beautiful thank you note, Brooke's brother's tie with boats, and one of the bottles they had pre-ordered, which happens to be the most expensive bottle I will ever enjoy. They departed before my shift the next day. They ended up taking care of everyone who helped them out and tried to personalize each gratuity they left. Housekeeper who mentioned her new baby got a tip equal to the room price and pack of diapers. Valet got money and some new designer sunglasses. One of them was actually sponsored because he forgot his. The wine is gone, the tie is torn, but I will remember these two forever and hope they are both still spreading joy and appreciating the beauty around them. Still have that thank you note. Am I the jerk for upstaging my grandma at her wedding? I'm 28, female. Maternal grandma is 71. This past weekend, she got married to her boyfriend of a couple years. This is her fifth wedding, which I mention not to judge, but because it's relevant later on. The last time she got married, I was a junior in high school and wore a cranberry strapless dress that my grandma purchased for me, very much in line with the cocktail dress code. I didn't try to do this, but in hindsight, I wore makeup that was way too much for a wedding. I just wore what I would normally do, toned down smoky eye, eyeliner, and a lip. One of the granddaughters of the husband she was marrying then pulled me aside and told me I did too much and that I should wipe the makeup off before photos. I was extremely embarrassed. The only other wedding I had ever been to was when I was six, so at the time I had no idea of the etiquette and was mortified that I had broken it. I ended up wiping off the eyeliner, replacing the eyeshadow, and putting on a clear chapstick. For this wedding, my grandma reminded me that I should do a very toned down look and not upstage her at this wedding. These days, I don't wear nearly as much makeup as I used to, so I went with my daily makeup routine. BB cream and a light concealer, a cream blush, some light mascara that was dark brown instead of black, and a sheer glossy pink lipstick. I paired it with a navy blue dress that I tried my best to match my grandma's request that the dress code is between casual and cocktail. My grandma didn't say anything about how I looked during the wedding, nor did anyone else, so I assume I did a good job of making sure she was still in the spotlight. However, today she got some of the photos back from her friend who was taking them. She said that I was the standout in all of the photos and it was very tacky of me to try to get all the attention on me when it was her wedding. I apologized and said I tried to be as toned down as possible while still looking presentable. She said the right move would have been to wear no makeup at all and wear a more conservative pantsuit. At the time that I got this call, I was with my paternal grandmother. They do not get along in the slightest. Paternal grandmother told maternal grandmother that it was unreasonable to expect me to dress frumpy to please her and that she had three sets of wedding photos for weddings before I was even born that she could look back on to be the star of the show if she wanted. This led to maternal grandma telling me she wished to take a break from speaking to me for a while so I could reflect on my selfish actions. I felt really bad. I didn't mean to wreck a special day for her, and in hindsight, maybe I should have approached my dress and makeup with her before the wedding, so I thought I'd get some feedback here to see if I'm the jerk and if what I did was selfish. Not the jerk for either of her weddings. You do not owe her an apology. You did nothing wrong. She's ridiculous. 
It's not dissimilar to people who tear others down to feel better about themselves. That's essentially what she wants to do to her friends, direct them to be lesser so that she feels better about herself. Not on. Not the jerk. A woman in her 20s wearing no makeup and a burlap sack would upstage a 70 year old. There is no way to avoid it. She can get over herself. Am I the jerk for telling someone with a service dog to please not sit in the compartment I booked? Some relevant information is that I'm 18 female and I have an allergy to dogs. I also live in an area in which there are overnight train rides. I had to take one so I could see my friends and celebrate my 18th. I booked a compartment for the train ride so I would be comfortable. About an hour in, a young lady like myself came in with a service dog and opened the door to my compartment and came in. It wasn't locked because I had forgotten. I asked her what she was doing and she replied with, There is more than enough space and I need the extra space for my dog. I was a little annoyed to be honest. I replied, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you to please leave and not stay. It's because I have a disability, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's because I'm allergic to dogs. Are you deadly allergic? At that point, it sounded menacing. No, but I would rather not be sick when I arrive. Besides, you should have paid for a compartment since you knew you would need one. She started yelling that I was being a jerk. One of the workers came past and asked what was going on. I provided proof that I booked the compartment and told her that I was allergic to dogs. The worker then asked the woman to leave and apologized to me on the train's behalf. I told her it wasn't her fault and it was all good after. Now a lot of friends think I should have just let her and moved myself to a different part of the train since she needed the extra room for her dog. Now I'm asking you if I'm the jerk. Update. Please be patient with me. I've been trying to answer everyone, but I'm very backlogged as there is only one me. Some information that was either missed out on the original post and some theories. I did pay a lot extra. I think her service dog was actually a pet or emotional support animal and not properly trained. This was not her first time. She has done this a minimum of one time before me as this incident was her second warning. None of my friends have any allergies. To see where to go from here, I was reading your comments and I have a game plan. First is that I have an appointment with my doctor tomorrow. Thank goodness they have a spot and will be talking with my friends tomorrow too. Mostly to see if they apologize, but also to see if I can mend my relationship with one of them who has been my best friend for a really long time. Other than her at this point, I will have no problem cutting them off. I see so many red flags I ignored before and now realize how terrible and a little toxic some of these people are. Thank you Reddit for helping me reflect on these incidents. I'm also going to contact the train company and put a formal complaint in. Not to get some form of compensation, although I wouldn't say no, but to make sure that this doesn't happen with someone who has an allergy much worse than me and could be lethal, but the woman just brushes her off. I will try to get back to everyone if I give a really general reply, it means that I do appreciate the comment and it helped also that you put that a lot better than I could have done. Not the jerk. You took reasonable accommodations for yourself. She didn't. You aren't being a jerk, you're being reasonable. An allergy doesn't have to be a deadly to be a problem. OP. Thank you. I was genuinely concerned how I came off. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.